Welcome to the Peace Dependency Podcast. I'm your host, Frank, also known as Sir Maser. In 2021, a new classic Tetris documentary will be released called Best of Five, the Classic Tetris Champion. Recent enough to talk to director Chris Higgins about the upcoming documentary, we also talked about his role in the Classic Tetris World Championships. This is our conversation. Chris, welcome to the Peace Dependency Podcast and thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. First question is always the same question to everyone who's new on the podcast, and that is how did you get into NES Tetris? I've been looking forward to this question. Um, I I think I was interested, introduced to NES Tetris by Adam Cornelius, who's the director of Ecstasy of Order and one of the founders of the Classic Tetris World Championship. Uh, he's an old friend. We went to college together. And we both also moved to Portland, Oregon, which is very, very far away from where we went to college together. Um, but I remember going over to his house. It must have been 15 years ago, something like that. Ooh. And he was playing NES Tetris at his house yeah. in 2005 or six or something like that. And uh, he was already at that time interested in, in you know, doing stuff with it and said, uh, he sort of well, like, handed me the controller and was like, hey, we want to try this. And I tried it for about two seconds and said, nope, too hard, too hard. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but yeah, that's actually the, the majority of my involvement in Tetris has come from um, being somebody who's uh, like, a, like a referee or a filmmaker or a writer. I've written articles about it. Yeah. But I'm really not a player. People ask me my personal best and I'm like, I don't have one <laughs> yet. <laughs> How many times have you played the game? I was thinking about this recently. I think if you had to add up every single time I have picked up NES Tetris and played a game, it is definitely under 100. It's probably under 50, maybe. Yeah. It's it's very low. I mean, and so the thing is, I don't know if that's... There, there, there probably are probably a lot of people who are in the, the category with me who I have watched and been, you know, right next to so much Tetris... Yeah, but I have played so little Tetris that you know I'm I'm a good example of um, even if you know what you're doing intellectually, it doesn't mean you're good at the game. <laughs> you need actual experience uh, with using your your you know fingers to make it happen. Are you just not interested in playing the game? It yeah, I mean it, it's oh I, I I think about it like I think about certain sports right. There are people who can be a fan of say you know, soccer or something, but they don't, and they might play around with it a little bit, but they don't necessarily go out and, you know, actually play, right? Yeah. Or if you're like, a, if you're interested in watching tennis, right, you don't necessarily go and buy a tennis racket and get tennis balls and go and find a court and get good at it, right? I know. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's been my experience. I have the same feeling with hockey. I watch hockey right. almost all the time, but I've never... I used to be a, a long-distance speed skater. So mm. we have a hockey rink in the middle of our oval. And when I was doing training, the, the hockey players were always playing. But I was always interested in watching it, but never actually playing it. So then a couple of years back, I started to watch the NHL. I started to following following the Dutch uh, hockey scene. And but I'm I'm not interested in playing it. I just love to see it. Is that the same what you have with Tetris? Very much so. And part of why I wouldn't want to play hockey is because I, I feel like I'd be hurt. <laughs> I'd be injured, right? <laughs> and so that's sort of the same thing with Tetris. It's like when you spend when you've spent your entire Tetris life around the literal best players in the world, like you know, five feet away from them doing like that's been my role. Yeah. Then you just know that if you'd say, well, I'm going to start from zero, you know, then the outcome is a little bit more disappointing than if you just started from zero, I think by yourself with no prior yeah. expectations. Now, I will say I might take up the game as kind of a stunt uh, as part of this uh, Kickstarter we're going to talk about, because yeah. I think it would be interesting to take someone who really has not attempted to play the game at all. Um, I mean, you know, and I, I think I, I came across it. Certainly, um, I probably played it on a Nintendo or a Game Boy. I never had a cartridge. I never owned a Game Boy. I, you know, so I, I never owned this game except it was on everything. I mean, I probably played it on a cell phone, you know, but yeah, I never had a phase in my life where I was, you know, it, actually playing it. 
but I think it might be funny or and or instructive to say, yeah. okay, well, what happens when you take somebody who should know <laughs> like intellectually what they're doing and just try it? It sounds like a games called video. It yeah. sounds it yeah. sounds like a video he would make a topic about. Yeah. And he's been like by the way, he's really been been doing a, an amazing job lately. So I've been communicating with him a little bit about uh, how these videos come together. And I think that's exactly what I think. I think there's a lot of side quests when you go into making a Tetris film where you think, well, here's a little side topic that doesn't fit into the main thing. Yeah. But it would make a great YouTube video, like a gate, a great, you know, song scout or game scout video. Um, and why not? Right. Like let's, let's just go ahead and take some of those things and not try to push them into the middle of your documentary about a tournament and just make a map of it anyway. Yeah, just just one video on the internet, what you want to see. And it doesn't really fit the classic Tespis channel, to be honest, topic that he makes on. But for, for his channel and what he's done since, I believe, 2018, it, it, it suits his channel. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's, a, there's an, a curiosity, like a genuine intellectual curiosity about uh, how do people play, why do they play, and then a generosity of, like, explaining things to people. Yeah, and I think that that explanation, the ability to be clear uh, and straightforward when explaining something, is really valuable, and it's a real it's a real skill and talent that he has. Uh, so I, you know, if there's anything I can offer to new to, new you know NES Tetris players, I'll be glad to do it. Although I think the main thing I'll offer is just that um, it's a lot harder than it looks, and True. I know that not just for myself, but because. I've been at all of these tournaments starting in 20, I think 2011 was my first one. And 2012 was the first one where I worked. And um, we had an issue where people would walk by and they would just say, well, I could do better than that. And you'd say, well, there's a Nintendo, grab a controller, give it a shot. And you would start them on even nine, much less, you know, 18. And they would just go, oh, oh, oh. I, fe I felt in the same trap. The first day I picked up a, uh, picked up Paul Tetris. I thought level nine, okay, that's that's a good level to start on. I topped out with like thirty thousand points. Yeah, people who have been to CTWC in Portland might have seen you and known you, but a lot of people in the community may never have heard of you. Can you introduce yourself and tell us what you have already done within the classic Tetris scene? Yeah, so my name is Chris Higgins, and I have been a referee or a judge or a camera operator at TTWC starting in 2012. Um, I also worked on Ecstasy of Order, so I was a writer on that film. I, I wrote parts of the narration and taglines and stuff like that. Um, I'm a longtime friend of Adam Cornelius who directed that film, so I've been just sort of, because I live in a, a relatively small town and um, he's here whenever someone has needed you know, help with things, it's like natural for him to call his friend and have me come over and do it. So if you go back and look at the video of any CDWC, like anything that's actually in the Portland era, I'm probably in it. Like I'm in all the um, all the the ESPN specials. I'm usually yeah. running a camera up by the front. And so recently, like in the last, I'd say two or three years, my role has been to uh, run most of the camera stuff. Um, yeah. And by that, I mean operate, literally like just be the person with hands on cameras. And we usually have anywhere from... I mean, we used to have four, but now I think we had something like nine or ten cameras last year. So it's a it's a department, really. And so you, you're getting instructions over a headset to go and you know, <laughs> uh, you know, get this thing or you know, go refocus on um, uh, on someone because the camera's just you know decided to autofocus somewhere else. Yeah. And running back and forth. Um, so I, I've helped to make the the tournaments happen and help to transition them into kind of the modern era of being recorded and filmed, you know, relatively well. And I also, uh, because of being part of Ecstasy of Order, um, Adam and I would sit around and talk about doing a sequel, right? Yeah. And so a few months before the 2014 tournament, he said, he just he just called me up and, and said, um, I, maybe it was six months before, it was a good ways before that one. He called me up and said, why don't you just make a sequel? to the movie because it's where this will be the fifth year. I made a movie about the first year yeah. and so much has changed, but we never made a movie about it. And I said, okay, <laughs> and that's, <laughs> you know, and then that was, that was six years ago. Right. So, uh, time passes. 
Oh, and we will definitely be talking about that documentary in a bit. But during CTWC, where you handle the cameras, what kind of production goes goes behind filming CTWC? It's a very special challenge, and I'm glad you asked.、Um, the for for one thing, it's important to understand that the the era of kind of the modern era of tray vision, like the sort of HD games,、um, started in、uh, probably 2016. Maybe 2015, and a visual language got developed, and that language involved we have、uh, either a two-up display or a four-up display.、Yeah. Now, prior to this, what we had, I'm not kidding, was they would just run one of the out- analog outputs out of an NES into a security camera <laughs>、uh, switcher thing. And so, if you imagine that your job is a, like you're a, a guard, and you、yeah. have you know four or eight or sixteen cameras to monitor, it just puts it. Tiles them together in an analog way, so you can watch them on a television set.、Yeah. This is a device that's from like the 70s,、Ooh. maybe. Very, very, very low quality, but it had a way to do a two-up mode and it had a way to do a four-up mode or a sixteen-up mode. And you can see that in Ecstasy of Order. That's what's being projected, and that's what they projected in like, you know, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Like that's what all we had, including in 2014 when I, you know, shot the film. Yeah, but it was very clear that this is not、uh, this isn't really great, right? So in 2014, we added webcams,、um, which were you know 2014 era webcams, and、yeah. OBS existed, and so we were able to put together a thing where you could see little faces of people and stuff. But it was really rough. It was really really rough. In the modern era, essentially after Trey、uh, came on, Trey essentially leveled the whole thing up, and I'm not sure who specifically it was, but I, I was. I remember being there when this discussion happened. The idea of having players putting the cameras,、um, they they crisscross. So imagine you have two players seated、yeah. in front of a television. They're looking straight at their own television. We wanted to create a visual effect where it looked like they were looking at their stack, and their stack was going to be in the middle of the screen. So to do that, you had to put a camera. Uh, off in front of the other person's TV and then tilt it over. You would、yeah. like, you know, rotate it, and so you would crisscross. You would be pointing the right one at the left player and and vice versa. And typically, we'd have four of these cameras up front because you'd have four TVs up front.、Uh, then we'd also have, yeah, you know, that's kind of the basic. That's the baseline thing you would need. And so you need at least, you know, one person to operate those cameras because people move around.、Um, And then we started adding cameras like the hand cams.、Uh, so in the final matches, we put one of the cameras way up high, tilt it down, and get the hands、uh, on、yeah. the controllers. And I think we'll see more of that in the future.、Um, we also last year we had、um, when Alexi came, we just sort of rented some more cameras. And by the way, these are are kind of these are semi-pro camcorders. They're not like. I mean, if you want to buy them at the store, they'd be a thousand dollars, something like that. And we, but the problem is we have to rent like six or eight or ten of them. So we needed something that's like very simple and straightforward, so I could go through and and configure every single one of them to be the same.、Yeah. So in 2019, a good example is everything was running at 60 frames per second, six zero.、Um, it's a very dark room, despite trying to add light to it.、Yeah. Um, And we had four across the front、uh, for the players. We had one off to the left,、um, which was kind of where Arda and kind of the the interviews would happen, and that's where Alexi was. And that was that position over to the left would allow you to also to turn that camera and look at the broader stage. And then back in the audience, which was a, that was a huge room in 2019. In the audience, we had、um, the commentary table, kind of in the middle of the crowd. And a little one of those camcorders was just straight, at, you know, pointing straight at those commentators, and there was no person to run that camera, and there was usually no way to get through the audience to get to it. <laughs> so I was just like hoping that it was working, you know. So I go in there, and you know, we'd wire everything up and get power to everything, and make sure the memory card was as big as humanly possible, and just、yeah. hit record and go.、Uh, but In the past couple of years, it's at it's at a point now where we all have headsets,、uh, wireless, you know, intercom systems, and we have a at least one camera operator who is remote. Like there's no they, with with a wireless video link, 
And last year that was James Rex Rhodes. And so you would say, basically anybody who was on the mic would say, hey, James, turn around, like <laughs> turn to your left, look in the, you know, look between these two rows of people. There's going to be a little girl and she wants to count down the Tetris. And yeah. he would turn around and you would watch his video. And I, and I remember doing this saying like, trust me, this one's going to be worth it, you know? And then someone gets down there and you, know, you get the shot, right? And then all that stuff is getting recorded individually, plus the the actual broadcast stream that's going out is being recorded in two or three or four ways. I forget how many we ended up doing. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, there was just so much data that, you know, after Saturday night, I would go home and dump, I want to say, 15 memory cards. Ooh. Yeah, the total data size across just two days was almost five terabytes of uh, video. It was an incredible amount of video. And there's audio recorders all over the place. And uh, it's a it's a huge operation. And a lot of it really is Trey Harrison, um, you know, having set up his... He, he literally is like a wizard behind the curtain because he's back there behind a curtain. And yeah. the, the most fun is when he comes out to play and you just kind of cross your fingers and hope everything stays working, right? <laughs> There's panic when Trey is playing a game at the CTWC. Anything could happen. And well, one thing that was kind of fun last year in, in 2019 was um, we were in the first rounds, I think, on Sunday. And Matt Schoolmaster's game, someone noticed he had no blue pieces or something like that. It wasn't like no blue or no red. Yeah. And we're watching it. The game is definitely happening. But you look at it and you're like, huh, how is that? how is that possible? Yeah. And just panic set in because like the event is occurring. You can't stop anything. It took us probably 15 minutes to fix this, but what it was in the end was, uh, an RCA cable, just a, you know, a little video, a little thin video cable that was 25 or 30 feet long had yeah. gone bad. It had gone bad between when it was installed on like Wednesday and that Sunday morning it worked on Saturday and it just suddenly, oh it had dropped into black and white mode somehow. Like it wasn't passing color data. And so the thing on, on Trey's end would recognize that and it could figure out, you know, two different shades. It could figure out white and something else. Yeah. But it couldn't figure out the third color. Um, so anyway, we were, we were very concerned. But, uh, and it took a while to figure out exactly what that was. But it's, it's telling that for the most part, we haven't had massive tech failures, you know, live in major events. Um, it's only a matter of time, but <laughs> these things are very fragile. Don't and jinx so, it. <laughs> yeah, I don't. And I, I think I just jinxed it. But I mean, like one of the biggest things in setting it up would be like we had to go and set up all of our cameras and then tape everything to the floor, like all the cabling, because all of it is a trip hazard. And if anybody like pulls a thing out of a, you know, if they if you pull the power out of a camera, all of a sudden you've got big big problems or power yeah. out of an yes or whatever. So. There's a big team. The camera team is usually, you know, five or six people. Um, and it's a, it's a labor of love. Like for the most part, people don't get paid or if they do, it's a, you know, it's a token sum, but it is very exciting and very, very visceral to yeah. be two feet away from Joseph running the hand cam. Right. And just being yes. like, I am watching this happen in front of me. I can smell the green tea. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. I used to reach out. This is the thing I used to do with the hand cam. He, Green Tea would put his his tea down and it would block the hand cam. So I would just reach out and move the tea over and over <laughs> again. And he would reach over for his tea and it had just moved, right? <laughs> I felt really bad, but I was like, well, it's what you got to do, right? It's funny. It's the second second Green Tea anecdote we, we had on the podcast because Mark was telling a story about he was, uh, Green Tea was playing Guideline Tetris in, in the middle of the queue of... Uh, qualifying for classic Tetris. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, Green Tea, uh, uh, one of the, I mean, I think also I've seen more, uh, you know, in the last couple of weekends. I love watching a player who's expressive, right? Who's having, yeah. I mean, I don't, I honestly, like if they're having a good time or a bad time, it's, that's less of my concern. But I just love seeing emotion. And Green Tea is like an open book. Like, this is what I'm feeling. I am going yeah. for it. It's great. I love to watch it. It's, it's a bummer we couldn't see him this year, but I'm, I am confident we'll see him in future years. So. He, had, he had good reasons. Not he had to, good uh... reasons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Uh, what's it like to be head referee of a world championship? 
very confusing. Uh, and I'll tell you, the first year I did it was, tw- I mean, I, I was not head referee in 2012, but I was head referee in 2013. And yeah. And then kind of onward for a while. And, and part of why it's confusing is because you have to, um, the first thing I asked was, well, what am I refereeing, right? If I don't know this game all that well, and I had the, initially I didn't, now I do. Yeah. What am I looking for, right? Like, And so the, it boils down to, you know, for the most part, you're dealing with um, gently explaining to people what the rules are because you have a, a mix. You've always had a mix from day one in, in CDWC where people come in and they'll qualify and they don't know what the rules are. They don't know you have to start on level nine and higher, for example, in a qualifier. Yeah. And so having to, you would, I would have to go over and find somebody who'd been playing from level zero and they were on eight and I hadn't seen it. I had to walk over and have to say, I'm sorry, you need to stop your game and start over again. And so the process of being a referee, really a lot of it is sort of just telling people what to do in a, in a gentle and, and confident way. Yeah. Um, making sure that you maximize the turnover of those uh, stations. So saying that like, you know, my wife and I actually were, we did it together for a couple of years where, you know, she and I would be, she'd be at one end of the line and I'd be at the other end of the line. So we could immediately identify when a game ended. And I would just kind of be like getting that person out of that chair. So she could send that next person over there. And I would hold up a hand and point and hold up a hand and point just yeah. to get that moving, to keep it moving as fast as we possibly could, because, you know, it's important to maximize, you know, the, the attempts you get. The, yes. other thing that, that, the thing that we really worry about is, is technical malfunctions. And those do happen where like um, someone, even just unplugging your controller and walking away, sometimes that's enough movement to pause someone else's game or, you know, cause their, their um, NES to malfunction. Really? Yeah, I've seen it several times. And sometimes it, it was, it's been kind of controversial at times yeah. because people have been having very good games and... You know, there was an incident, I don't forget, and I'm not going to say who it was or whatever, but the point was someone was having a pretty good game, like in 700s, 800s, something like that. Yeah. And somebody else had a bad game and was mad. And so they kind of slammed the table and the other NES glitched out and froze. Oh, no. Yeah. And so what do you do? As the referee, you have to make a call in that exact moment that is fair and that is you know something like you have to you now you are the person in charge yeah so like in those kinds of cases i would say i'd essentially say i need you to not you know hit the table if you're angry it's okay to be angry just don't you know make somebody else's game uh, <laughs> suffer for it uh, i would also do things that are just functional like i'd say I, I would go ahead and if i saw a machine that was having glitches i would retire that nes i would just say i would rather have no one play this yeah. than have more than one person suffer a, you know, a lost game on it. And so I would turn those off and then just ra- raise the flag for someone else that we need to go get another NES or another TV or whatever. There was yeah. a thing in 2017 where like a TV had a sleep mode and it kept popping up a timer on top of the display after being on for like an hour or something. And that we could not find any interface to turn it off. Oh, and, man. and that ruined a game as well. Um, yeah. And so we began, we've developed these really elaborate procedures to say when a referee or a, you know, when someone has seen a Nintendo or a TV act badly, we need to physically mark that so that everyone else knows this is what happened. Don't use this again. So they don't take that TV and put it on the stage and have that happen during, you know, championship play. That would be terrible. And honestly, that's a real problem because, you know, we are working with old, unreliable equipment and so we've gotten we've we've been fortunate and part of that is we do maintenance you know we do take apart these machines and clean them and yeah but it's uh there is a burn-in period so when i would go in and do it i would set things up and burn in every machine for hours like make sure they were running yeah they could withstand you know jiggling movement shaking slamming um and it's important to do that because if you don't then all of a sudden you're going to lose a a match at some point this year you were a judge for the ctwc qualifying What's it like to fulfill that role this year? It was fascinating. It was so fascinating. And this year, so what I did was I, I judged qualifiers, but I didn't judge the main event because I just wanted to watch the main event because it's my, it's like the World Series for me, right? Like yeah. I, I wanted just to say, I'm sitting back and just enjoying this. So in qualifiers, um, I think I did the most people. I did something like 34 independent qualifiers Ooh. and they started on every half hour. 
And so yeah. what would happen is I would, the time would come, uh, well, prior to the time, I would uh, get on Discord and send a message to the person saying, here's who I am, and I'm going to walk you through some steps, and some of them you know about, and some of them you might not know about. Um, and then, you know, hopefully they would reply, and we'd, you know, get on the, get on a, a, a you know, a voice call, yeah. and I would walk them through various steps. So show me your, you know, controller, show me all these things. Um, and, and force them through a process of verifying that their equipment was real and was actually plugged in and stuff like that. And right. it was, um, I mean, for one thing, we did have a ton of equipment failures in qualifiers. I saw probably five or six times when an NES just froze, um, yeah. for seemingly no reason. I saw times when they froze for obvious reasons because somebody threw a controller or whatever. <laughs> Doc's saying I could to say who, but you know, like it's, it's clear when that happens. Um, yeah. And again, but the thing that I liked about it, and you would have to make a decision, right? So, okay, if that happened, um, does the game count? Do you have, get extra time? You know, all these sorts of things. Yeah. But the, the main thing, the thing that I loved about it was that it was um, it was similar to the idea of doing it in person. I felt like I had a one-on-one -on -one connection with these people, and I was rooting for all of them. I'm like, you're my player. Like, I'm going to watch you on mute. You know, I'm going to watch your little game playing for two hours. Yeah. And then I'm going to go back and review the best games you had. And I get to see like your house or whatever, you know? Yeah. And it, often they'd have to call me back because something went wrong or whatever. And they had to re re verify, but I, you kind of develop a little bit of a, a working relationship with people where you're like, okay, here we go. Okay, well, your controller came off. Okay, fine. Let's pull, let's plug it back in, turn your camera around, do this thing. Yeah. I loved having that, that those moments with players. Well, what's your most memorable moments during the qualifying? Huh. My most memorable moment. <clears throat> Honestly, so, you know, the, you know, the world, the, the context of the world that we're in today, right? Uh, I, I'm living in the U.S. I'm on the West Coast and we're under a, a pretty serious lockdown. So yeah. I have not had a haircut since February. I don't leave the house very often. Um, so I have, I've developed a world where I'm in the house and uh, my wife and I have a treadmill in our garage, uh, where the car usually is, but we have other reasons to put things in the garage these days. Yeah. So in the morning I go out and I get on that treadmill and early on, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, uh, before the way we had it set up, we had different people in different time zones who had said, okay, from UTC, you know, this time to that time, I'm going to take people every half hour. And so I had said, well, I'm just like broadly available through this huge period yeah. and Vince, I think very rightly said, let's trim that down. So, <laughs> you know, Chris, you're going to be available like, you know, I think it's 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Um, mm -hmm. Your local, my local time. Uh, and I said, well, OK, fuck, I don't know. But turns out, yeah, if you do if you do eight people a day, you get very tired very fast. But in the mornings, I'd get up and get on the treadmill and I had a, like an iPad in front of me yeah. and I would just fire up Twitch and see who was qualifying. And the most notable thing was when I. Uh, fired up i think it was anna d um uh, anna yes yeah and i'm just watching this and i you know i'm op i have the chat open and i'm just watching this thing happen and it's very much like you know game scouts video where i had that realization like everybody had that realization which was like oh okay so here's somebody building on the left i've seen that happen you know building for a left well and <laughs> i had seen that in other qualifiers already yeah um but the realization of like oh this player is terrific like this person is like top tier you know th th this th she's got a shot and and so realizing when she's getting these pieces over there like this is somebody who you know next year like there i was just so excited to see a brand new player and by the way the audio on that is so bad and i was listening to it in my <laughs> headphones like doing my morning workout and i'm like i can't hear what you're saying it sounds like an it's like a fan in her computer. It's had like a, like an aircraft or something. Profile picture on a Twitch page is now a airplane because <laughs> of that stream. Yeah. Yeah. But it was just such a delight. It's a delight to see new players or to see players where you've never seen their faces before. You've seen them play in, you know, CTMs and stuff. Yeah. But you actually get a glimpse of them as humans. So that was one, I, I you know, watching, um, I guess it was Hydrant Dude. Um, you know, watching that qualifier, that was something. Um, I was actually the... I was the, the qualifier judge for both Dog and Pixel Andy, um, both of which were amazing qualifiers. But there's this moment where Pixel Andy is playing and for some reason Dog just walks in the door. Yeah. I didn't know they were brothers. 
almost nobody knew. Nobody knew. And I didn't have like special information or anything. It was just like, okay, here's this person's like Twitch handle. And you know, like this is when yeah. they said they signed up. So I'm sitting there and I'm just like, wait, what did you see that? What? Oh, <laughs> oh what? So that was a delight. Um, and the fact here, here's the overall thing. The fact that qualifiers were by themselves, like a, a really fun week of like awesome Tetris I did not anticipate that. I thought qualifiers were just going to be boring and like, <clears throat> you know, like who's going to want to watch this? Yeah. But when that week was over, it felt like we had just watched like a tournament. It was super I loved it. fun. I loved it, really. Every, every day, later in the week, they, they showcased on Classic Tetris all the qualifiers at the same time. The love from the community and it was so fun to, like, you, like we said, you could practically watch Tetris 24 hours a day because if you were sleeping and someone in else in a different time zone <laughs> were qualifying, you could watch that VOD back. Right. And yeah, it, was, it was a lovely week. Well, I, and I, I guess I also have to say, watching Joseph, I mean, it was... It, it, I, I, I commented later that it was like the moon landing, right? Like People yeah. will say, where were you when Joseph got all those max outs in two hours i was asleep <laughs> well I, I yeah i was i was lucky enough to be watching it and my wife tuned in as well she was actually in in quarantine like self and she had you know had to go traveling and was coming back yeah but we were both watching it in two locations and um it, we just kept texting each other just being like did you see that what's happening oh my God. you know so and it because because both of us had been at the tournament physically and had like met Joseph and, you know, worked with him on qualifying before, there's like a little bit of an extra connection there. Yeah. But you can, it doesn't matter. Like that, that's, you're watching the, the greatest, like you're watching the greatest of all time and you're just watching that person. It's another day at the office. He walks in and just lays everything out and, you know, then just walks off and, you know, takes a bio break and comes back and then does some more. Like, yeah. you know, no big deal. It's, it's natural. Yeah. Hey, we're coming off of two weekends of double nation qualifying tournaments. This all for a spot at the top eight main event. What did you think about these eight qualifying brackets? I thought they were, um, I thought the best of five format was brutal. And, but I thought that it was brutal in a way that made it fair and also made it so that like, I had the experience every day of you know, starting the Tetris in the morning. And, you know, for me, it was sort of midday. Yeah. Um, and so I'd start one channel and we had this, we had to set up a way to watch two channels of Twitch at once, but we, you know, we figured it out. Yeah. And for about the first three or four hours, I'm like, okay, I'm really, I'm really paying attention to this. I'm really into this. But then there came this level of exhaustion. And normally in a, you know, in-person CTWC, all of this stuff is happening at such an accelerated rate. Like yeah. there's the people on stage, but there's also people kind of off on side stations and they're just trying to, to get matches done with, you know? So the early ones is going to be like seed one versus seed 64. Well, I like, get that done and over with and just move those people out. Yeah. This was different because everybody got best of five, potentially twice or three times or four times or five times. So watching like Nanu and like, some of and watching, for example, Jonas. Like Jonas played a lot of games. Um, it was a lot of fun for me to watch that, but also there was a level of exhaustion as a viewer where I was sort of like, I'm kind of ready to be done with this Tetris at this point. <laughs> it kind of was too much Tetris for me to handle. Yeah. Uh, but it, on the other hand, like I'd rather have that than not enough. So uh, I did download all the VODs as well because I'm like, there's stuff I missed on Channel Two when I was watching Channel One and, and vice versa. So it was a it was a, a beautiful thing to see and the ability for people to go through that comeback, that second chance bracket and make their way back up. That's amazing. And that it actually occurred is like fascinating. So like yeah. to watch people battle and play, you know, 20 plus games at such a high level is amazing to me. And I think really speaks to the level of play. Like the level of play here obviously is the highest by far that we've ever seen. And every year we keep thinking like, well, the level of play we're seeing cannot be exceeded. What will it be next year? Like, where can we go from here? Because of the world we're living right now, uh, it had to be online. But that's also the part why the the level of, of play is so high. Because normally people who can't make it for various reasons to Portland are now, uh, can now play for the World Championship. And people who, who crack it during the CTM Masters events or during Classic Tetris League, 
they they can play right now and and i think that is one of the reasons why the level of play is so high this year yeah and and this is a thing that i think americans are extremely bad at understanding that there is a rest of the world and so we tend to name things world championships that are functionally u.s championships right Baseball. so <laughs> yeah exactly the world <laughs> series i mean obviously no one else plays baseball anywhere else so whatever um you know so this is a classic american cultural problem uh this year we had the opportunity to actually see a world championship right yeah. and i think that there are elements of that that we have to learn from you no know, regardless of what happens next year if we have if we do have an in-person thing at all or not um because th that's the thing is like having we always knew it was a real problem a huge expense um and this is part of what my film by the way ends up being about like it's an incredible expense even if you live in the states to fly to portland oregon and like get a hotel for you know potentially four days or something and then fly home and buy all your meals and all this yeah. stuff so it's something that was a huge limiter and so when you take the the financial limiter of the at least $1,000, if not a lot more, just to go and everyone loses except one per, you know what I mean? Like that's mm -hmm. a terrible burden. Um, the idea that you could actually say, okay, listen, you, you need a, a minimal set of hardware. And yeah, it's, you know, it might, that's, there, it's not like that's a free thing. You still have to have hardware and you have to have a computer that's capable of doing this and an internet connection and a camera. It's a lot of stuff but it's not like thousands of dollars worth of stuff. Um, it opens things up in a way that I think is fair and important yeah. and gives us, shows us, okay, if the question is who's really the best in the world, I'm so glad to actually see more than, you know, one to three countries represented. Um, now we do end up with a lot of Americans in this final bracket, but still along the way, we actually saw a substantive, you know, gameplay from players who are not in that sort of us centric scene mm -hmm. and I, I am so excited by that because i think it really does legitimize the concept of a a world championship right yeah yes i, I do agree we had a couple of international brackets uh, we had two all american brackets and one bracket with one person from antarctica um, <laughs> is it true that that quaid was representing mars last year uh, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to comment on, uh, uh, you know, interplanetary controversies. I can say that Quaid, Quaid is actually in, I didn't interview him, but he is mentioned a lot. And there are some moments that come up in, in, in 2014 because Quaid got a max out in qualifying. I think he got the first one that year. I think there had been one the year prior. So yeah, we grabbed him and had an interview with him. And his attitude, if I remember right, I mean, this is paraphrasing, but essentially Vince, you know, gets on the mic and says, okay, Quaid, you just got, you've got a max out on qualifying. This is a very unusual event. Um, what do you have to say? And Quaid is like, I mean, he just sort of like, he does not care. He does not want to be like the, what he's, what the, the, the attitude he's giving off is I don't care. Yeah. So he's saying, I don't care. I guess I'm good at Tetris. Um, I guess I'll go do another max out now. I don't know. Go Buko. And then he just walks <laughs> away. He just literally just turns around and walks away. He does not care. And I would ask people like, why, why do you think, uh, Quaid doesn't care about Tetris? And everybody's like, Quaid really cares about Tetris. You don't get that good at Tetris. You know, if you don't really care, True, Quaid yeah. is playing, Quaid is playing a character. And I was like, oh, I'm so dumb. I just, I never... <laughs> I didn't grow up with like professional wrestling or whatever. Like, so he's basically Quaid is our pro wrestler. And so I love seeing Quaid bring that kind of energy and that kind of unpredictability and the, the, the sort of Hauser Kauser, uh, complexity that comes up and sort of these, these inside jokes, like the whole thing of yelling, Buko. I love think it. that was the Quaid and his brother where they just picked a guy to just say his name yeah and now that's a thing um anyway I, I i about the mars thing and the antarctica thing um i i don't know i don't no know comment further no go comment i mean <laughs> maybe i do know and i'm just not saying we will return to the conversation with chris in a minute but first if you like the peace dependency podcast help us grow please share the podcast with every classic tetris fan 
Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Peace Dependency. You can like our Facebook page, Peace Dependency Podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where we have all the podcasts uploaded at full length. Also, you can listen to the Peace Dependency Podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Join the Kingsman Tetris Friendly Discord server. Besides the fact that it's the place to discuss anything PDP, you can also participate in some lovely friendlies or put your ELO on the line in the various ELO battles. Last but not least, if you have a suggestion we need to have on the next Peace Dependency Podcast, let us know through our socials, Discord channel or send us an email, peacedependencypodcast at gmail.com. Now, let's go back to the conversation with Chris, where we'll talk about the upcoming documentary, The Best of Five, the Classic Tetris Champion. Hey Chris, the main reason you are here is that on Friday, October the 30th, you announced that you are working on a new Classic Tetris documentary. It's called The Best of Five, the Classic Tetris Champions. Before we go in depth, can you tell us what this documentary is about? Yeah, so on the, well, let's back up. There's a very important documentary that chronicles the beginning of the Classic Tetris World Championship. That documentary is called Ecstasy of Order, um, the Tetris Masters, I believe. And that film, you know, and I worked on that a little bit. And that film is about the beginning, right? It's about Robin Manhara and like trying to figure out how we're going to make this thing work. Um, And it makes a lot of sense. As a film, it's very, it's a competition film. It also Mm -hmm. talks about Tetris. It also has emotional resonance. We talk about Thor and his story and and what's going on with him. Um, And I think it's a great film. Now, the thing was, I don't think this is a spoiler to tell anybody. Well, let's just put it this way. Uh, For the first four years of CDWC, the same person wins. So by four years in, The community, which was, we thought, extremely large. Now, today, the community is a hundred times larger. But (laughs) we thought, listen, can can this guy be beaten, right? Like, we had the serious problem, which was, look, we all get together. People are paying all this money. They're coming to this place. And it sure looks like we have an unbeatable player. Because he just comes in and just destroys. And that's not a problem in the sense that, I mean, clearly, he's the greatest player. But at the same time, it's not that much fun if you're going to spend money and come and try to compete and then you're just going to get destroyed. So when we came in for this this fifth year, first of all, I wanted to check in on how I wanted to make a film that just documented what is this tournament? Why does it matter? And what's going on here? Right. But the biggest question, the big operative question that every player was was struggling with was how can I beat the four time champ or can I? Is it physically possible so you had people who were trying to, like, actually, maybe I'm going way too into this <laughs> early. Doesn't the matter. Point, <laughs> the point was, I just wanted to, I wanted to pick a year and document what was happening. And so go leading into it, so months in advance, I began following players, interviewing as, like, as they were getting ready, as they were training, and asking them, what do you think is going to happen? What are you worried about? Like, because yeah. there's a lot of players in Portland where I live Um, I was able to go and just talk to them endlessly. And then Mm -hmm. when, you know, tournament, the tournament actually comes, I documented everything about that. So how do they actually set up the, you know, NESs? How do we test them? Where are they? Like, what is they, how does that all work? And then how does tournament day work? How do, what happens on the tournament evenings? What are those parties like? We actually had the party at my house that year. And I think the next couple of years, uh, those parties are the, the after parties, pretty fun, right? I wanted to show that stuff and also to explore the question of why do we have a scene so dominated by one player and can that person be uh, defeated? And again, I don't want to like, it's, it's difficult to tackle spoilers with something that happened six years ago. Yeah. I got really lucky, right? Like I picked a really good year to ask that question. (laughs) Um, And I followed the right people because I happened to follow in depth, like, the people who ended up in, you know, positions one, two, and three. And then I followed a bunch of other people who were lower down in the ranking. Right. So we ended up with this very detailed look at, uh, the state of the, the, the state of the tournament five years in. And I think that's a really interesting thing to look at now that we're 11 years in, it's a very similar kind of thing. So as you have these sort of unbeatable players, people veer toward what that player is doing. So when yeah. Jonas was doing very well, people started trying to be Jonasy 
right? Or, and frankly, a lot of people really were trying to be like Harry. They were trying to adopt the things that Harry and to some extent Jonas were doing. Yeah. And then when, when Joseph came along, obviously people tried to be like Joseph. And those things change the fundamental tournament and the, the fundamental sort of meta of the game. Yeah. So it, by by doing this film, I'm looking at the first time that that meta uh, actually changed. And then that's instructive for later, the fact that it's changed again. And I think there will be, by the way, future movies. I don't think I'll direct them, but um, there has been some some thinking about you know, there's definitely been a second turn in, in how this all, all works. Yeah. So we may see that in the future. You said that you came up with the idea with, with Adam Cornelius. How do you come up with with an idea like this? And and what's the reason you wanted to do it five years after the original, uh, original documentary? Yeah, I mean, I had actually worked um, earlier, I think it was that year or the year before. Adam and I had, had tried to make a film, a documentary film together. Uh, about uh, cryptocurrencies, so like Bitcoin. Yeah. Except we're focusing on the things that aren't Bitcoin. The other, like, there's all these other coins. Yeah. And the reason we did that was because Bitcoin had a kind of culture around it that could be a little bit, um, a bit dark. A bit dark, right? Like there was a little bit of oddness there. But yeah. things like Dogecoin or Litecoin or whatever were more interesting and fun. So anyway, the point is, he and I tried to make a film, and we tried to crowdfund it for seventy-five thousand dollars. I think is what we asked for. Yeah. And we got about ten thousand dollars. We didn't get it because it didn't didn't succeed. But yeah. we wanted to make this film, and we were gonna, we we're doing it in the conventional style, which is you say, okay, let's make a documentary. We know how much it costs because we've worked on multiple features before. Yeah. So let's just ask for every dollar we know we would need to do it the best we can, right? Yeah. Now, what we discovered was there is not enough market for the movie we're trying to make, this this crypto coin thing. And so we had to just drop that project and not do it. And so yeah. I found myself saying, well, look, I, you know, I want to make a movie. I still want to make a documentary about something. And so um, that's sort of this plan B thing was, well, what about classic Tetris, right? Because it actually has changed so much since the first movie. It doesn't even resemble the, 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 you know, the tournaments look different. They're in different places. And now there's five years of history. Um, the beautiful thing about a tournament is that there's always uh, a climax. There's a, a moment when people are going to be battling. They're going to be playing against one another. And yeah. those moments are like, that's what you want in a film. Like you want the film to not just be people talking about Tetris and let's like looking at Tetris, you want there to be stakes. You want it to matter. Like what we want to know, we want to care about this player and how is it going to turn out for this player? Yeah. So the beauty of that format is it had a built in like climax to it. I knew that something would happen at the tournament, whatever it was. There has to be a final. Yeah, there has to be a final and there has to be a winner. So, yeah. you know, and like worst case scenario, um, well, and I, I that's a, the wrong way to put it, but like for me, the best case scenario would be there was some kind of upset and then every other case was still acceptable, right? Yeah. Because you, you wanted to see, you wanted to see each individual person's uh, desires. You wanted them to say in their own words, why am I doing this? Why do I care? And you want the audience to feel that with them. And you want, I wanted everyone to win, but I knew of course, only one person can win. So everyone's heart will be broken. Yeah. Every single player is going to be heartbroken except the winner. Right, for because there's only the one winner, right? Yeah. And so I wanted to be you know, I wanted to show that because it actually is such an emotional thing. Um and when you when you do documentary film, it's it's a difficult balance because sometimes you come in and ask someone to relive a moment that was very painful for them or that meant that like they didn't get the outcome they wanted. But afterward, yeah. you're saying, please reflect on that for me. And I had to do that with, uh, I went to LA the following summer and I sat down with uh, Jonas and I sat down with Harry and I handed them an iPad that had the games on them. And while we were taping an interview with them said, watch this and tell me what's happening. And they did. Uh, and it was not fun. I don't think for, for Jonas certainly to watch that. <clears throat> But Jonas is a very nice person. And so Jonas yeah. sat there, he watched it, and he, you know, kind of shook his head and he was like, oh, you know, like he would make a mistake in the game and look at his own game. And years later, I think it was maybe 2017, maybe 2018, he told Arda Ocal in an interview, 
yeah. that that moment was actually the moment that made him decide not to retire because he decided he realized in re- he hadn't watched the games but yeah. in re- because why would you because it was the game where like you know something went bad for you yeah. but in watching the game he suddenly was like oh wait wh- i i actually i think i know I, how i can play better here uh, and that's and, and the, what's fascinating is also when you go to harry and you show him those games again he also has the same reaction he's like wait i see something here that i can change and when yeah. i say okay what is it he's like i'm not going to tell you <laughs> <laughs> so there's a difference there because you know with jonas you say what is it and he'll just start diving into like well okay if i do this thing over here but harry harry's just kind of like he looks at it and he's like hmm i see something i'm doing wrong i think i yeah. know how to fix that I'm going to fix that, and I'm not going to tell you what it is, <laughs> which is delightful. How do you start on making a documentary? Who do you want to be working with you? Are they are those people that you know or worked with before, or are those people that are completely new to you? Who do you like to have on your team? Yeah, so on this documentary, I had no funding. So, And this is still, I mean, now I have, I'm running a Kickstarter six years later, but all the money that got spent on it got what was came out of my bank account and I'm not a wealthy man. So this was stuff where uh, I had to make really careful decisions about who I would hire and how much we could afford, I could afford to pay them. Right. Because I, you know, I was spending money in the hopes that someday down the line um, I'd be able to sell the movie and people would then pay for it. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So what I did initially was I, I didn't hire anybody. I went in by myself. So there's a lot of interviews in the early days where I would go in and I, w- I would bring the lights and the sound and the camera, and I would also run all of those simultaneously and do the interview. Yeah. Um, I had done that before a little bit, but usually on my team, like I had done a lot of work with Adam where it was like a two to three person team, and I would usually be the sound person. So when Adam and I would go on shoots in like New York City, for example, it was a common setup for him to be... Uh, on camera part of that's because he's very tall so for walking around having a tall person with a camera is just helpful they can move it around a lot yeah Um, i'm just like a normal height person uh but i I have a lot of training in in sound recording so i was a sound recordist back in the 90s because i'm old and um i would just carry around two they're called shotgun microphones they're these long skinny mics and i would hold them and just get audio and, and be wearing big isolating headphones and have the sound recorder around my neck so I could like, you know, look down and make sure it was working all right. And so I had a lot of experience doing that. And then Adam and I would do these setups where we would both, uh, we kind of moved on and we would do interview setups where each of us would, would operate one camera. I would operate the sound and then one or the other of us would be the interviewer. Um, yes. So I'd gotten used to that. Uh, but I was, I was used to that with Adam. Like that was the person I knew the best. Um, I, you know, I'd worked on other projects as well, uh, but that was the setup that I was really comfortable with. Now, Adam during the tournament is busy. (laughs) He doesn't have any extra, like he's not available to come and and do that stuff. So uh, the, the short answer is I did most of it myself. So a lot of the early work is just literally me in a room by myself. And I'm proud that that worked. Um, later, uh, like for example, in, well, during the actual tournament, um, I hired Lewis Holland, and Lewis is our director of photography. Um, he's a guy who has worked with Adam and Vince on other projects. He was the director of photography on The Palindromists, which is a movie that uh, Vince directed and Adam produced. And I actually shot a little tiny bit of footage for that. That's a, a movie that's out um, in festivals right now, but it's it's now it's like the third film that has essentially the, a very similar set of people. So yeah, it's like ecstasy of order and best of five and the palindromists all have some mixture of the same camera people, directors, producers, and editors. Like they're just, it's kind of like it's mixed and matched, but yeah, I just, the people that I knew. Right. And so I hired him uh, for a very low wage and rented this unbelievably expensive camera equipment that he, whatever he preferred. I was like, whatever it is, you know how to use best. Yeah. I'll go get it. And, um, he was the kind of person who didn't require a lot of direction. And I had seen it before because I'd seen his work in other projects. And so I just knew like, okay, this, and he, he was very familiar with ecstasy of order. Yeah. And I said, you know, you know what Tetris looks like, um, do your best. And I hired other, other people as well. Some of whom did require more direction. 
later the following summer when I had to go and do stuff in LA, um, by the way, we also interviewed John Tran, uh, known as Blink, who founded Hard Drop uh, when we were there because he was there. We just decided, like, let's go ahead and spend an afternoon learning what his stuff was. Yeah. When I was there, I hired my friend Carl King, who is now the composer for the new uh, the, for this new film. And it's the idea there is Carl King, like me, is like he came to it from sound initially. Then he got into being, you know, a photographer and a filmmaker. Um, so, and he, you know, does lighting and he just knows how to do a lot of everything. Yeah. And so that's a typical thing for a, a small documentary crew. And also he's a, an old friend of mine. So I wanted somebody who I just knew and I knew I could say w without having to be very gentle, say like, you know, please make this thing happen. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, and he would just handle it, you know, and he also knew in the same way that if he was having a problem, he could just, you know, raise his hand and say, Hey, we're stopping now. We're doing this. So I would try to have the smallest possible team. And you look today at documentaries, a lot of times you'll have like five or six people in a room, you'll have multiple cameras that are operated by people and they're like, the cameras are moving and there's like a whole person for lighting yeah. and a whole other person for sound and a whole other person who's dealing with like, you know, overall production stuff and the interviewer to me, like that's neat, I guess. But to me, there's an intimacy to being a, a single person, you know, alone just having a conversation like, yeah, there's a light on and yeah, there's a camera, but at some point, the fewer people and the less stuff, the easier it is to get an honest answer out of somebody and not to have them feel the pressure of, you know, like, oh, I'm being in a, I'm in a movie. It does so, make it make it feel more organic. Like it's a real conversation and we don't know that the cameras are here. I, yeah. And I think we haven't, <laughs> we obviously haven't released any footage, right? So the thing is like the trailer that you see on Kickstarter, it doesn't, it's, there's no sound. It's just like the tournament days. Yeah. What you're not seeing is literally hundreds of hours of me sitting in like Terry Purcell's basement or going to Terry Purcell's like school. He's a school teacher. Yeah. Um, or, you know, all these different setups where we'd go and have an interview or like, you know, interviewing, um, you know, Jonas at his house. Like we interviewed him in a different room than where he streams, but like that's his house. Right. And like, you know, Oh, anyway, the point being, there's a lot of material where people talk about their feelings, they talk about their game, they talk about what it all means to them. And um, I think that'll be coming up soon. I'll probably try to put together like, by the way, here's a list of people we interviewed and kind of like a screenshot at least of, of yeah. what those all looked like, because there's a lot of that. I was I was thinking about that. How did you contact the players? Because obviously they knew you for being head referee in 2013. But did they knew you, you were working on Ecstasy of Order? And uh, what was the reaction when you asked them to be on the new documentary? Well, I knew some of them because this is the thing I probably should have mentioned earlier. I wrote an article in 2013, I think, which was titled Playing to Lose. And it was a magazine feature about the CDWC. And that article, at the time, that article was like ESPN. Like a lot of people read that article and found out about this tournament and came into the scene. Yeah. Um, and so that was interesting. And and because of that, I had contacted Bo Style and Ben Mullen and interviewed them at great length. And also I'd, you know, I'd met them in person at the tournament and I'd, you know, refereed and all that stuff. But because of that, that was one thing I had done. And the fact that I'd been, you know, I'd done Ecstasy of Order with Adam, it was very easy for me just to sort of say, like this is, this is a small world. Everybody knew everybody. And so if I just called them up and said, you know, like I, I know Adam, I know Robin, I know Vince, I, you know, everybody like <laughs> we're all friends with the same people. Yeah. Do you, are you interested in sitting down to talk with me? Everyone said, okay. I mean, it was actually incredibly easy to get uh, agreement because I think it was clear that it was such a small group of people who were interested in this hobby to begin with Yeah. that the idea of being on camera with someone was really unusual like we didn't have we we weren't on espn back then like we were just barely streaming on the internet at all yeah so i think they were just they were keen to be on to talk about it and they, by the way like the f number one thing i would say sitting down uh with a uh, with a player was you know i'm making a film here but my my concept of making a documentary is i'm here to represent who you are and what you want I'm not going to turn you into a bad person and I'm not going to mess up your life. You know? Yeah. So if you, and there's a lot of films that have, have cast people as villains, uh, especially in, in, you know, in an attempt to make there be more drama than there really was. 
And that has really hurt people as people. And I, I don't subscribe to that. I'll, I'm going to tell the truth, but I'm not going to be a jerk about it. And so I would just be very upfront about that. People would, sometimes people would say they would be, be put off by that because they weren't expecting that there could be a possibly bad outcome to being in a film. But then they'd say, well, why do you say that? And I'd say, well, in King of Kong, um, the documentary, I mean, it's a great documentary. I enjoyed watching it, but the edit was extremely manipulative. It, had, yeah. it actually did intentionally manipulate the behavior of one of the players to seem that that person was more of a villain than they were. It just it straight up lied. It said, you know, this person never showed up to this meeting. Well, he did, actually. And that had turned off people to being in documentaries in general because they saw that, you know, if someone couldn't be trusted to to be accurate, um, why would they share the truth? Like, why would they bother to sit down? So True. Yeah. I tried to say, like, listen, I've, I'm an honest person. You can see the other work I've done, and I care about you as a person. <laughs> and I, I hope that that's... I hope that comes across because it, it's important to me to be a good person and it's important in documentary not to just use people as pawns to make a fun yeah. story. So I think that's why they talked to me like because I, I was extremely upfront about that. Yeah. How did you prepare for the interviews? Honestly, a lot of the credit here goes to Adam, Adam Cornelius. Um, we had worked together and I had seen him do his thing. Um, At the time, I had spent the last couple of years working as a, a writer writing features. So a feature for, you know, as a profile, you go and you talk to the same person 15 times and then you yeah. assemble a story about, you know, how did their life work? And it's a little bit different in a documentary because in a documentary, you're going to interview, the, you're going to interview person one and then you're going to interview person two. And those people might end up in a head to head competition later. And so I had asked Adam about this and he, you know, gave me kind of the 101 of this. And so for anyone who's listening who wants to make their own competition film, what you do is you make a series of questions that you make sure you ask. So for instance, uh, you say, okay, I'm sitting down with Terry. Terry, yeah. tell me about uh, Jonas. Tell me about Harry. Tell me about, you know, like and I would ask simple questions like, you know, when did you start playing Tetris? And Um, what does the game mean to you? I had these sort of stock questions, but the most important thing was to make sure I had um, asked them about specific other people so that when inevitably I had the other person in front of the camera, I could then say, all right, <laughs> all right, Bo, uh, here's what Ben said about you. Well, how do you respond? Right? Yeah. And it's not, you know, again, it's not like these are, it's not, this. It, nobody was mean, um, but you could say, You could, I would ask questions the night before, actually, we had a, a set of interviews on Friday night where I would say, like, who are you worried about running up into in the bracket? Like, who do you not want to play? Yeah. Right. Who or who do you want to play? Meaning, who do you think you can beat? And those answers are great because or I would also say, like, who do you want to have win the whole thing overall? Like, what, what do you who do you think deserves it? Yeah. Um, and. A lot of, and those answers are very revealing and very honest. Um, so you would ask these kind of canned questions, but the other part of it was you had to pay a ton of attention as an interviewer. And this is true of any interview, you know, like, but you have to pay attention and, and kind of go off on the tangent with the person. So if they suddenly start going into like, well, when I was a child, um, you know, Tetris was my escape. And I, I, you know, there's a world in which you would hear that answer and say, okay. And then you would ask, you know, question two. But yeah. in my case, I'm like, tell me more. Then they would say, well. You would improvise. Yeah, I would just keep trying to get farther and deeper and deeper down that that thing. And eventually you would get an answer that's like, well, you know, as a kid, we moved around a lot. And the one constant I had was my NES. And yeah. the game I was best at is Tetris. And that was a way I could escape into a thing where I felt safe. And I felt like I was on my own. and I, I had control over something. Yeah, And you're like, aha, now ha here we have an emotional reason for why you're doing something. Not that you just like want to win or you want to brag or whatever, but you, this is a functional thing that's you're carrying with you from childhood. That's why you kind of started here. It's maybe not why you're here today, Yeah, but I loved to be able to get down, to spend so much time with someone talking to them that you would get to those, those things. Um, and also, by the way, the ability to sit down with someone more than one time You would inevitably, you'd do an interview and then you'd like, you know, walk away and you'd watch the tape later. And then you'd say, man, I wish I'd asked about this other thing. And they'd say, okay, <laughs> go back and interview him again. Ask him about the other thing. 
or ask them the same question five times and see if the cha- the answer ever changes, right? Just see where you go with that. And yeah, I, I had the luxury of having people who were local to me. I didn't have to travel to get them, and I could just say, "I'm coming over," and they're like, "Okay," <laughs> you know, like sure, <laughs> I'll have some beer, you know. And when you interview the people, did you write a script afterwards, or uh, don't you write a script at all after until all the footage is shot, or do you work on a basic? on a basic script so i i resisted this a lot there there's an idea um in documentary called writing the movie where you write what you think the film will be before you shoot the film and the concept there is that if you've already written out what you think is going to happen then you are you're paying you're just sort of like making sure you have the footage to make all those parts work yeah i actually refused to do that until after i'd interviewed probably 20 people Um, because I felt like when I would go in and do a magazine profile about somebody, I wanted them to tell me using their own words, what had happened. And then I was going to say, okay, well, based on that, this is what the truth is. Cause I felt, I still felt like there was something where I didn't want to, I didn't want to be pushing them into my narrative of what I, you know, like I wanted my narrative to come from the truth that I discovered yeah. Which is a very hard way to do it, right? Like it's it's easier to come in and say the story is about this. So everything you say, I'm going to just steer you back towards this. I didn't write that script and I still have not written like the majority of that. So Gilbert, the assistant director and I, we're breaking these episodes. We're planning on 5, we might go to might go to 6 if we get enough money. Yeah. Um but we're trying to make sure that we have all these little story arcs. And so we have essentially like thousands of little note cards that are these little you know, mini things like these little mini parts of the discussion. And the way I would construct those is I'd, I would go back through all the, the interviews after they happened and clip out the parts that I thought were good and then just write down all of the things that, that were in that little clip. Like here's where the person talks about level 19 maxes. Here's where they talk about, um, you know, Jonas. And here's where they talk about whether everyone is actually emulating Jonas's game or Harry's game and why are those games different and so on. Yeah. And so from those, I wanted to then derive the story from that. So in that sense, we're doing something that's a little bit harder. Um, but we are bringing in, for example, we have a narrator, so we can have that kind of like, if we need to fill in the gaps, we have, we have a way to fill in gaps later. Uh, but I really believe, um, strongly in, in going in and just being open to what, what unexpected things are happening now having said that i wasn't completely unprepared i would come in with a list of questions but i was always willing to throw the questions out you know or once i got through my kind of stock stuff then say all right you know let's get into something more interesting or what what is it that you wanted to tell me about this stuff and that might that often would like send us into a whole different direction um so i'm I'm glad i did that it's it, it is a contributor to why this has taken so long to even really begin editing because the we had to, you know, do preparation where we went through and reviewed hundreds of hours of talking and tried to t- pull out all the themes that were in there because we didn't force it in to begin with. We didn't start out by saying, this is a movie about this person beating that person. That's all we care about. We started out by saying, this is a movie about Tetris and people who play a difficult game for very little recognition, very little money, and very little fame uh, on their own. Um, often like in their basements, a lot of these people are from the working class. Like they don't need to be buying like a lot of equipment to do this. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? What does it functionally mean? Um, so that's what we did. Is that the reason why the documentary is still not out instead of, it could have been out in late 2015, early 2016, but it will be coming out uh, next year. It's, it's a reason. I mean, honestly. There's two big reasons that there's two big things that came up. Thing one was in 2015, I had a trailer and I showed the trailer and some other sample footage um, at the CDWC. And I I think I remember saying, like, if the movie's not done next year, you should all be mad at me. Well, I mean, they can people begin to be mad at me. But um, I thought it was just a matter of like, um, I thought it was it was just a matter of sitting down and spending more time staring at this footage and and putting it together. Yeah. Bigger problem came in when a, a, this is true. Like two two things happened. Uh, thing one, I realized I had so much footage that I would have to simplify this thing so radically 
to fit into the box that I had envisioned, which was a 90 minute long, like feature documentary, which is what I'd always just assumed it was because that's what ecstasy of order is. And that's what the palindromists is. And that's what I thought we were making. Like there wasn't, let's, let's be very clear. There were not like a lot of successful documentary series in 2014, much less the years prior. So today it's like, Oh, tiger King comes out or like, Oh, the vow or whatever. Like all these things are, it's, it's common to have a long multi-part documentary series on streaming. Well, yeah. we didn't really have streaming, you know, so I hadn't conceived that that was a possibility. So I was struggling so hard to say, how can I tell a meaningful story in 90 minutes or maybe two hours, like at the most, that was really hard. And I was struggling with it and I was editing and I was just finding myself frustrated and, and bothered that I wasn't able to fit more in. That was thing one thing too, was Trey Harrison came along, joined the team and invented Trey vision. Yeah. which then allowed him to make HD gameplay. And then the the thing that happened right after that was Boom Tetris for Jeff, where all of a sudden we had a huge audience on YouTube who all expected every game to be HD. They expected that two up rendering with the two players on you know either side. Yeah. We didn't, that didn't exist. That was years away from existing when I shot the film. So what I had in terms of like video of the games was I had an RCA output going through a USB like recorder that recorded a flash video file at 320 pixels by 240 pixels of each TV. That's what I had. Yeah. And I had talked to Trey right after he invented Trey Vision and said, well, gee, can I run this footage through your system? And he gave it a shot and it didn't work. He was like, this is not, this is not what it was intended to like. I didn't design it to do this, so it doesn't work. So sorry, right? <laughs> and the problem was the more popular YouTube got and the more people expected, like, this is what classic Tetris looks like, the more that just putting up two fuzzy standard def things next to each other wasn't going to cut it, you know? So in my movie, it was going to look terrible even because Trey came in and modernized the game by leaps and bounds in the course of essentially one year. Yeah. And then everything from then on was what got popular. So I had this, this sort of second level problem, which was, okay, I don't have high definition games. I don't have tray vision. I, and I'm, and now we have a huge viewer base from YouTube who assume that that's what everything looks like. So if I come out today after that with a movie where everything's in standard definition games, it's going to look stupid. Like it's just not, it doesn't look like the right sport, you know? Yeah. So I really struggled with that too. And I, you know, I'd go back occasionally to Trey and say, is there anything we can do? And his answer was, you know, honestly, like it's, it's a lot of work. I don't really see a, a way to get there from here. Well, the thing was, this is the uh, silver lining of the pandemic lockdown. In March, there was this moment where um, my state locked down and California locked down right at the same time. Yeah. And I just called him. I texted him, I think, and said, can I call you? <laughs> and he <laughs> said, sure. I hadn't talked to him in a long time. And I said, look, uh, I've got this problem. You understand the problem. And I'm hoping and just sort of crossing my fingers, but maybe you have extra time to look at, to give this one last try. Like, is that possible? How much would it cost? And he said, he just sort of thought about it for a while. And he said, well, uh, you know, essentially his work was on hold for like uh, the, the day I called him, he said, you know, my current project, you know, they're not sure how we're going to proceed. So I, I kind of have just been put on, on pause for like a day, but it yeah. could be as, as long as maybe four days. I just don't know because the virus and this, all this stuff. So I just don't know, but I do have a little spare time and I guess I can look at this one last time. So I was like, well, that's all I can ask. That's, you know, more than like, that's more than generous. Take a look. And within four or five hours, the first set of matches came back to me in Trey vision and they had problems. So like he said, look, I ran, I upscaled your video. I ran it through this thing and the recognizer has problems. And by the way, you see similar problems in what we've been watching on the 2020 thing on, on max out club. Yeah. Like there's the blocks will sparkle. They'll change colors. You'll just, things will you know move at the wrong rate. Like the blocks will disappear randomly because that's what's in the source footage. Like the, the video is not good enough to render everything perfectly, but he's yeah. like, here is a tray vision copy of this match. Do you want me to do the next match? And I had to just like jump. I was like, Oh, Oh, 
oh, it, it's possible. Oh, no, it's possible. Oh, yes, it's possible. So I just grabbed all the matches that we needed and like, you know, I had to cut the flash video files that were hours long and say like, it's from this point to that point. And he had to recalibrate Trey vision every single match because oh. every single TV was different and every file was different. Then they were, they were all bad in different ways. And he would send me back a file and say, look, I saw errors here, 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 and here that you'll have to figure out how to fix manually. But, you know, but it exists. Right. And I was like, wow. Okay. How long did it took from the first game to the last game to have all games into Trey Vision? Uh, I want to say five and a half days, Jeez. calendar days. It was extremely fast. And he, he told me midway through it, look, I'm getting rumbles that my day job might be coming back right away. So I want you to make sure that you're giving these, these to me in the order that you might need them because I will probably have to stop before we're done. Yeah. So I didn't translate every game I had. I translated every match that I could possibly imagine using, like in a narrative sense, um, which is still like hours and hours and hours of matches, right? Uh, it's all of the top eight, and it's all a lot of the stuff leading into those top eight brackets. Yeah. But but I put it in order. I was like, well, okay, obviously the final match is the most important match, and then the things that radiate out from there are the most important things. And then the top eight are the most important things. And then if you have time, these other things like are kind of kind of fun. Like there's a match where, um, uh, Trey was the 32nd seed and Jonas was the first seed, I believe. Yeah. Like they, he, anyway, Trey had, had, had intentionally gotten himself seeded. <laughs> so he would get, he would get to face his friend Jonas in the first round and get destroyed. But when he, um, When he did the tray vision, he wrote me this thing back and he just wrote it like in all caps, like I was robbed because <laughs> now that there was a long bar drought counter, which we never had, right? No yeah. one had ever looked at those games. He just got droughted. Like he just got terrible RNG and Jonas was just like having like a normal set of games. And so it looked like, well, anyway, the point is like, yes, Jonas is a better Tetris player. Let's let not kid ourselves, but it was just really nice that it worked it worked yeah. the fact that you have statistics live that you know this person is actually getting a terrible rng sequence uh makes it so that you can actually say something different about the game you know the game actually didn't go that well and it wasn't purely because like he was just not good at tetris he's great at tetris he's terrific at it but he had terrible luck and he was playing against Jonas in the first round so you know what's going to happen is going to happen but we managed to get games like that matches like that as like the last couple of things but the file that I would get um I had to go through each of those files frame by frame and I when I say frame by frame I mean I press press forward and I you know Ooh. frame by frame we're talking hours and hours and hours of footage and watch just with my eyes to see if Uh, something in the stack changed colors. Yeah. And, go, and if it did, I had to go back and paint in, like find a square and put the correct square where it was for one frame. And then it would come back again. I mean, it was, you know, don't cry for me. Right. But like, wow, it was a lot of cleaning. And so I spent months um, cleaning these files up. Um, and by the way, the other thing is the film is shot at 24 frames per second. Yeah. which is different than the game that runs at 60 frames or kind of 30 frames, depending kind of on how you think about it. Yeah. So Trey had rewritten as part of this, he'd, he had written Trey vision to output the games at my film frame rate, but it still try to have it look normal. So yeah. I was editing these games at this very strange time base. Um, so anyways, the whole thing, it's, it's, it's technical, but the point was, all of a sudden two things cleared at the same time. One of them was a realization because my assistant director Gilbert called me and said, you do realize that it is 2020 and you can do documentary series now. Right. And I was like, um, I had not realized that. And then I, I was like, wait a minute, this actually solves a lot of my problems except for the Trey vision thing. So he was like, why don't you call Trey? So I called Trey and then Trey fixed it. And you know, and that's, that's the story. Like, yeah, That's why all of a sudden I was like, oh, okay. So what I need is I need to hire a professional editor and I have to hire a person to do the score and I can do the majority of the other work myself, but I need a little bit of money to get that to happen. Um, 
So that's where the Kickstarter came from. And I ran it, you know, right around the time of the tournament because I felt like that's when people would be paying attention to classic Tetris. And yeah. we funded in 13 hours and now we're almost at 200% of what we asked for. We could still use more um, because what it means is more episodes, uh, more languages, uh, more, you know, like basically more stuff. Um, but what it does mean is this is going to happen. It is 100% happening. Um, you will have to pay for it. And by the way, this is going to be the best deal you're going to get. So if you, if you want to get the, if you want to get the movie, you're going to want to go to tetrischampion.com, which takes you to Kickstarter and like, like back it now because yeah, like next year you'll be able to buy the series as well, but it's going to cost more. Um, and also there's going to, there's some like special rewards that I don't think we'll ever see again. Uh, so yeah. I was going to talk about the Kickstarter at the end of the show, but we can do it right now. <laughs> okay. How surprised were you that you were funded within, what was it, 12, 13 hours? Yeah, it was some, It was like 12 and a half hours. I, completely surprised. Completely surprised. That morning, it was a Friday morning, I pressed the button. I Okay, so let, let's back up. Uh, it was October, I guess, 30th. So the next day is Halloween, which is the first day of, of uh, C CTWC 2020 online. Yeah. And then a few days later is the U.S. election, one of the most like big, all-consuming news events that anyone can possibly imagine. Yeah. So I needed to start this thing before the election happened, and roughly when the tournament happened, because the tournament, like you know, they were like I'm sponsoring the tournament, so people will be able to you know hear about the Kickstarter, so they can come and you know click on it and put their put their money on it. Yeah. I was having a conversation the night before, uh, no, two nights before with Gilbert, the assistant director who, by the way, made this happen by realizing it could be a series. And I, we had, we were going to ask for $5,000 total. And mm -hmm. he said, look, if we make this one change to the budget, do you think we could change it to $4,000? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, I'm just not sure we're going to be able to get $5,000. Right. Or $4,000. I'm not sure we can get $4,000 in the middle of a pandemic, yeah. in the middle of this. Like everybody I know has given all of their money to trying to stay alive and to support like, you know, their families. And so it felt very weird to me to be asking for money like at all, but also in the middle of a global pandemic. I mean, come on. You know, like it's just not didn't seem like a real smart idea. And so I was really, really convinced that we were going to spend 40 days chipping away like $10 at a time to get to maybe the $4,000. Yeah. So when 12 hours later, like that night, it was like, ding. And I thought, uh, like I, my goal, I was like, maybe we can get a thousand dollars in a day. Like if we get a thousand dollars in a day, I will be surprised. Yeah. And that's like, that's like my marker. So I did not know how to react. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still don't know how to react because part of it is like, uh, wow, right, is one thing. And also there's a there's a thing I've seen a lot of, and I'm not saying other people need to do this, but I have been stunned how many people have just been like, you know, here uh, here's 20 bucks or 15 bucks or whatever for the series and an extra $50 for nothing. I don't even want the poster. I don't even want the DV, like whatever. Just, just here's money. Here's some money. Yeah. I because I want this thing to exist in the world. And I, I, I agree with you that this is a story that, that should be told. And I'm like, I, it, like, it's an emotional thing for me. Like what the, the other thing I, I, I don't think this is clear to people, but I'll go ahead and say it. I have been unemployed since March. I've, I'm on government unemployment. I make, uh, I believe it's $172 per week Ooh. from unemployment. I have been working as much as I humanly can yeah. from home. Uh, I was a portrait photographer. I, I, I was, I had shifted my career right before the pandemic uh, to be a photographer. I was, I was doing in-person photo shoots. My last shoot was on February 29th of this year. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden that became completely impossible. Um, and so I was out of, I was out of that job and I, it took me very big shift to be like, okay, how can I do some kind of work, you know, remotely? Um, what, what it means that this Kickstarter will succeed, what it means is I'm, I get off of unemployment. 
Yeah. It also means that we get to have a documentary series. But that is an enormous thing for me and for my family. And it is so that's part of why it's hard for me to even understand how to, you know, like when you're making less than 200 bucks a week and you're asking for four thousand dollars to make a movie about Tetris. I mean, I like Tetris and I think Tetris is important and emotionally meaningful, but it's not as emotionally meaningful as putting food on the table. Like it just it just felt so strange to me. So I have been. uh working to process uh, the thing that I need to say, which is just thank you to the people. Like, thank you. Like, thank you for validating that you actually want this. Um, and at this point, what I want is I just want a larger number of people to give small amounts of money. Like, I don't, you know, if, if you have money and you want to throw lots of money at it, that's great. And we do have a good use for it. Um, but at this point, I just want a lot of people to be able to enjoy the thing when it comes out. I want to be able to do live streams when, you know, we'll release an episode and we have like basically a zoom party where I get on, yeah. you know, Gilbert gets on there. We get some of the champs on there and we just show, we show the thing and we pause it and just talk about it. Like, Hey, Oh, here's this one shot. Check this out. What, yeah. What's the story behind that? Uh, so that's, 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 that's what's happening. How did you get Joseph Staley to be one of the perks that people can can purchase in fact when they back your kickstarter well it was a uh, about a 10 month effort and a lot of bribes he has a lot of layers of management uh, that's actually not true that's just, uh, so <laughs> so what happened was we were trying to think of like okay what would be a good high dollar reward right because it's a movie obviously the basic reward is you get the movie like you get a digital stream right or a download or whatever yeah and then if you want more it's like oh a poster or a blu-ray or you know whatever but then it was like well we, we know Harry and Jonas. And so what if we had this like $500 US reward where you get all that other stuff, you get like the, you know, they get the movie and everything, but you also get an hour of their time to do whatever. I mean, whatever's legal, you know, legal stuff. Yeah. And like, it can't be in person unless they agree to it, I guess, uh, because COVID and, and so forth. But, you know, if, if you want an experience, it is, I don't think there, I don't think you could contact these people at any time ever and just get an hour of their time one-on-one -on -one for you you know and so i floated the idea by jonas and he said that sounds cool i floated the idea by harry and he said that's a, that sounds cool and i told them both i'm only going to do it if you both agree to it because i'm not going to have you know what i mean like it's it feels weird yeah um i think it was harry who said well what about joseph and i was like oh yeah crap <laughs> i didn't <laughs> like i i thought about it but i hadn't gotten it done so we launched with harry and jonas right so lesson with the champ you pay 500 bucks and you get to spend some time with the champ um yeah and then uh gilbert who has been in touch with uh this is the assistant director has been in touch with um joseph and i said so what about joseph and he said well I'll, you know i'll just get in touch and see what what happens and so i guess it was it was probably Thursday of last week. So be right before the final, um, bracket stuff. Um, he just, you know, sent a, I think it was a discord message or something to Joseph and was like, Hey, remember that thing with the lesson with the champ? We like talked about it at some point before, uh, are you into it? And Joseph said, yeah, sure. And then by the way, it's also important to be clear the way we're doing it, half the money goes to the champ. Um, so they're not just like giving me money to do work. <laughs> Cause I really believe like if you're going to do work, you should be paid for the work. <laughs> um, yeah. so if anybody buys these things, um, you know, like after Kickstarter takes their little, their little, you know, cut of the money, um, the champ gets paid, uh, in a, in a nice way. So it's a very limited reward. There are not a lot of these, um, but it is a thing people can buy and I'm excited to see what people will do with them. Cause I think like some people might want to, might want to do it as a stream, you know, or, yeah might want to just talk. I don't know. Uh, but I, I, it was funny cause Joseph, um, all three of these people are who they seem. They are all nice. They are generous. And they, if you ask them things that are reasonable, they'll say, they'll say yes. Um, I think as long as you have the credibility of saying like, look, you know, I'm not, I'm not just like a random person, you know, on the internet, I'm somebody who's met all of them, you know, and I've been standing there yeah. with a camera in front of them for years now. So I think it's easier for me to say, Hey, hey, buddy, how about this? And they're just like, okay, cool. 
uh, it's just not even a, an issue. And I'm, I'm grateful to them for that generosity. Um, and I'm also grateful to people who, you know, might choose to back at that level. Cause at that level, when somebody throws 500 bucks into this project, it's going to mean essentially at some point we'll, we'll get, I hope to get, you know, to the homepage of Kickstarter or something like the more money, the more attention. Um, and what I, what I really want is more people who just want to watch the movie, you know? Yeah. Uh, but there's some cool stuff up there. Also, if you would like to be a producer, if you want to be a literal movie producer with a an IMDb page and you will have, you will share an IMDb credit with me who has an IMDb page and has made Hollywood movies. You can buy that. And I'm, you're not buying the credit. You're buying joining the team. You get, you get on the emails, you get the rough cuts. Like, that's a thing that's there too. It costs a lot of money, <laughs> partly because I just don't want any random person you know, walking in and joining my team. Yeah. Um, but you know, if that's something that someone has said, listen, I've always wanted to know what it's like to make a movie. Come on in. Like, why did you do no that? Why did you, why did you offer up a, a, I believe it's an executive producer, quote unquote job. What did you put yeah. that on? Well, the first reason was the executive producer one. It's a $4,000 item. And I thought, there's a possibility that one person, because again, I, I was convinced we weren't going to raise, I was really worried about getting $4,000. Yeah. So I thought it was funny in a way to have a button someone could press that just one click and like they fund the whole movie. Because that's what an, an, an executive producer is a the, basically usually a money person. They can also have some creative, you know, relationship. But yeah. typically the role of, of EP is like, I got you the money. So the, the joke there was you could fund our entire movie, our entire remaining budget for this thing uh, with one click. And then the, the, the AP is like, I think is less than that. But the point was associate producer. Um, yeah. The point there was I, I, I think there's a, a, a goal of inclusivity, right? Like if you, I want to have more voices in the conversation um, but I don't want to have so many voices in the conversation in terms of editing these episodes and how we put them together and all that sort of stuff. I am open to that. Uh, now, like I'm open to that in the way that like I have chosen my team very carefully, right? Like I know who's on it and this is a way where I'm opening the door and saying, well, anybody who has $4,000 can come in and join that team. Yeah. Um, I do think that there's, there's a thing in Kickstarter where you actually, you, you actually can re refund or kind of like refuse a pledge. Yeah. So I, I guess it's hypothetically possible that if someone who just absolutely wasn't going to be a good fit came along and tried to offer that money, I'd be, I'd say no. Uh, at the moment, it doesn't seem likely that that's going to be a problem. Um, but I, what I felt like was there are some people in this community who have done extreme things with money. Uh, for yeah. example, like there was the year of, of, you know, having to buy an extra flight to get Yanni uh, to the qualifiers in time. And that cost a lot of money, right? Yeah. But the willingness to do that just because for, for love of Yanni, for love of the game, for love of the representation of someone who's not an American getting to, you know, actually be there, that that's important. And if people out there have, have that kind of money and they want to be in the picture, come on in. Like I'll, I'll, you know, like I, I'm interested in that. And I think that there are people in the community who probably do have that kind of money. Um, now granted, I'm not sure this is the, this is a very a weird time to be asking people for money. I I completely feel that. Uh, but if they want to put it down, I'll I'll make it work. And I, I'll also put it this way: like I think that there are some people for whom, like, it's not often that you have any option of getting into the movie industry. You know. Yeah. So if you're somebody who's like, look, I would spend a couple thousand dollars just to like get my first credit and be able to talk to the director and, you know, like have some access and understand like, how does a documentary movie kind of get made? Um, like it, it is a, that's something that would cost me a lot of time and energy to help somebody with, but for, yeah, for a couple thousand dollars, I would do that. And that would be a legitimate way for someone to get exposure to something that they just can't, you can't just call someone up, you know, usually and say, can I be involved in your movie project? Um, unless, you know, like, I don't know, like it's never been my experience anyway. So I think this is an unusual opportunity and I don't feel worried about it. Uh, in fact, I, I would be very keen to see what that relationship would look like. Right. Yeah. I was honestly, uh, surprised that you, you contacted me to be on the show to talk about this. 
And I looked at the Kickstarter page and you have a perk for yourself that you are, I don't know, it's a $500 perk that you will give four hours of your time to someone, talk about uh, uh, anything, basically. So I said to my wife, he's contacting me, I'm making a, a, a community podcast, I haven't done much episodes, and he's contacting me that he wants to be on the show. And if I saw what 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 a normal person has to pay for you to to get four hours of your time, and I got like two hours right now, it's it's very cool to see that. Thank you. I mean, at the same time, like I'm I'm just a person. I'm an unemployed person, right? <laughs> I, but yeah, no, that that's that makes a lot of sense. But I I have listened to every episode of this podcast, except I haven't finished the Kingsman episode. I got past about the first third of it and I have to, I was like, okay, I have, I'm going to pause this now because I was in the middle of like listening to election coverage. Um, but here's the thing, like I am a big fan of classic Tetris, right? So when there is a, when there's like anything that happens in, in classic Tetris land, like when CTM kind of started up and really became a big thing. And when like, that was one thing I, I, I follow as a fan. And so the other thing about it is, um, you know, Gilbert and I talk a lot about the idea of of representation, right? So uh, there being actual people who are not Americans who are playing this game, because that's probably, I mean, uh, for all I know, the majority of people are not Americans who are playing this game. Yeah. I, I'm interested and, and very intrigued by like CTEC and the other tournaments out there. Um, and so, oh, by the way, we have footage that's going to be in this movie that's from CTEC. Uh, I don't know the if the first I... CTEC? The first one, yeah, because what yeah. happened was Terry um, and I think Adam and Vince kind of went on a vacation and brought their cameras, and so I don't want to, I don't want to like spoil it or whatever. We have great footage um, from that, and so it'll be like you know at the end of someone's arc, right? Like the so, uh, for example, Terry went to that and he uh, he did well in a particular competition, but in the credits, you know, at the end it'll be like you know, and then you know, Terry went on to become whatever, right? But like Terry went on to become the champion of, you know, message redacted, but like, you know, he yeah. did, <laughs> went on to do this thing. <laughs> I guess my point is I'm like a legitimate fan of this thing. I'm a huge fan of this, which is why I've been doing it. I did it for totally free. You know what I mean? Like when, when I first joined the CDWC crew in 2012, that was a volunteer job, man. Yeah. Like, um, so like, yeah, like I do stuff, like I, you know, I make movies and I like, you know, write books and stuff, but, um, I'm still like a nerd you know, and a fan. And so when it's, um, when it comes to wanting to be on this podcast, I'm like, well, this is the podcast about classic Tetris. Right. And it's got like Mark on it explaining how many Hertz he's hyper tapping at and like how that gets measured because yeah. I am interested in that. I'm like genuinely like, okay, so how does that happen? Like, are you using like, you know, the, which kind of the, the shooting watch or whatever, like, how does that all work? This is, this is a community that, that includes people at all kinds of different like levels, right? Like people who are um, like one of our biggest fans, I think in the U S one of the most influential fans of our tournament is John Green. John Green wrote um, looking for Alaska. He wrote, uh, the Fault in Our Stars. Uh, he's a yeah. young adult novelist. Uh, John Green and I used to work together. Uh, I used to write scripts for him for Mental Floss magazine, and he like it's an old like I, I met him in college, so we're the basically the same age. We're basically both from Florida. We're some kind of similar demographic people. He's a big booster of this this sport, and he you know he came into the Kickstarter and just threw a ton of money at it, and yeah. uh, and he like came in the the he was in the Twitch chat being like by the way like I know the director and he's like you know, we used to work together <laughs> and I thought that's very sweet. Right. So John green, like, and by the way, I was, I was refing a, a fan of his and, and she had said the reason she got into it was because John had encouraged her to go ahead and try out because yeah. she's in, she's a fan of John green and the nerd fighters and that whole group. Um, and I had to really hold my tongue and not go into my whole, like, Oh, John green and I used to work together. I was just like, okay, <laughs> let's see your Nintendo, like turn it on, turn it off. Okay, cool. But, I, you know, when I then emailed John and said, here's the link, I was like, by the way, like, here's this player I was, I was, just, I was just talking to. And I thought you might want to see this because I know you're off social media, you know, good for you. So, yeah. you know, people are people. And like, I, I was also really pleased that somebody did buy that, but they bought one of those, like, you know, Chris Higgins, uh, things. Cause like where that comes from is, um, I do a lot of screenings now remotely. Like that's what I've been able to do while being unemployed. 
Yeah. So for example, on Thursday, I, I'm doing a screening of another film I made, um, for Warby Parker. They're a glasses company. Um, and I'm just going to be joining them remotely to like do a Q and a after a screening, but like these companies are, and you know, some of it's companies, it's educational stuff and whatever, but like, that's a little bit of work I've been able to kind of grab around the corners. And uh, I think that's what people are going to use some of that time for is like, do you want me to talk to your group? Do you want me to yeah. <laughs> whatever? Like, anyway, it's a very long answer just to say, like, <laughs> I appreciate the thing you're doing in the world. Like I legitimately listen to your actual podcast on my actual phone along with all of my other podcasts. And so when I thought like, okay, so where are the people who care about Tetris, the classic Tetris, where are they? They're listening to this show, right? So my core, if you're listening to me talk about this Kickstarter and you can afford the, you know, $15 US or whatever, I would love it. I think you're going to get at least that much value out of five episodes, you know, and by then an episode's probably going to be a half hour plus. So we're talking hours and hours and hours of stuff Yeah. over the coming year. So I think that's like, this is where my people are. I just wanted to, I wanted to talk to my people, you know? Is that your main target audience? The, the, the Tetris players, the insiders? It, no, well, yeah, it's half and half, right? So I think that like the people who watch CTWC and the people who listen to this show and like, that's, it's obvious to me that if you are somebody who's interested in that stuff, you are almost definitely like, I, I can't, I can't imagine you wouldn't like this movie. Right. Yeah. Um, at the same time, there's a ton of people who are backing who don't know anything about Tetris, right? They're fan, they're like fans of other work I've done or whatever. And, or they're, you know, fans of somebody else who's in the movie or whatever. They're just, they're interested in documentaries or they're whatever. So I do have to be careful when I talk about the movie to not spoil it for them. because they don't know, <laughs> they don't know that, you know, like what I happens. Have to be able to, it, it's an, it's a tough balance. Right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the, there are people who don't want to be spoiled as to like who wins what. And everybody could just grab Google and figure out like what happened in 2014. So there's a thing where in the trailer, uh, I actually blur out a person. Yeah. And I saw in the in the Twitch chat yesterday, somebody was like, why is somebody blurred out? And I so I added it as an FAQ. And I was like, the reason is because it's a huge spoiler. Like if you know who that person was in advance, then there's no drama really. Like, I mean, it'll still be fairly dramatic, but... Anyway, I, I just think that like one of the beautiful things about 2014 is that a lot of the matches that you, first of all, no one has seen these matches because the only thing that's on the internet is the finals, as far as I know. Yeah. So a lot of these matches, you don't know what happened and you don't know why that was an amazing match, right? So there are several of those where like it comes in and you're like, this is a match for the ages. And yeah, it's not a, it's not, it's not two 1.1s, right? Like that's a different, we're in a different era but the amount of tension is still there because you had a room full of screaming people who were losing their minds because they were seeing what was then the absolute best Tetris gameplay in the world. Like they yeah. were seeing it live. Right. So those players were pushing each other. And, uh, I just, I just love that. And I know that the people who love that too are watching the tournament and they're listening to this and they're in all the discords and they're, you know, I think there's like a lot of discussion about, you know, uh, tapping versus das versus all this stuff and that's fine like i i don't i currently don't take a position on that but i think one thing that chris tang said yesterday i think in his commentary uh it was an interesting note and by the way chris tang and, and james chen are going to be doing brand new commentary even though chris tang already commentated these matches live we're going to have them do it over again are they going to do it when they saw the match beforehand and then take notes of things they need to focus on or or, or are they going to do it quote unquote on a lifestyle so commentate what they see i'm trying to do this the, the, the latter so i'm trying to surprise them right so yeah. the goal is we're going to try to get them into studios and this is a very challenging thing but gilbert and i are working out a way to get them into a safe like studio environment where they can actually part of the thing about being a commentator is that you're physically next to that person and also part of it is an audience i don't think we can safely do an audience right now yeah but I mean, those, those two men have been next to each other for a lot of Tetris. And so if there's a way to do it safely, we're going to try to do that. But what we're going to do is Gilbert and I get the matches ready. We get the, the video that's, that's important for them to see. So they may even have like four or five different angles that they can see because we had, we had between six and 10 cameras rolling all day that Sunday. So we have GoPros that are showing the players. We have the game, we have the audience, we have 
all this stuff, right? And yeah. so we even have the audience reaction, and we even could be playing Chris Tang, his own commentary back, but that would be probably annoying and confusing. Um, but I want them to be surprised. So the goal right now, here's the, this, is, this is my proposed procedure. We might change this. But the idea is we're going to basically prep them a little bit. So we're going to yeah. say, okay, look, you're going to, you're, you're looking at a match that is, it's here in the bracket and we will have blanked out the remainder of the, bla the bracket, right? So it's this person versus this person. And so to get here, this player had to defeat this other player to get here, right? And yes. also here's all the background material you need to know. So it's 2014, right? <laughs> you, we're not going to have them pretend that they're talking in 2014. We're going to say like leading up to, into this, these people had faced each other in, you know, in tournament play. And this is, this is what happened. So yeah. here's the here's the rivalry that you're looking at and then have them just look at what they're seeing and react to it. And then we're probably going to run it through a second time. So that we'll do it all the way through just live and then record that. And my thinking is we might then do it a second time so that theoretically, if they see a second thing, we might be able to like kind of splice, splice those things together. Yeah. I haven't fully decided if that's the way to do it, but I want an, I want an honest reaction because um, you know, James Chen has never seen the games. So, and Chris Tang has, but it's been a really long time. So to have them now have the ability in, in Trey Vision to see the droughts and stuff. Um, and by the way, we're never doing a four up layout. We're only doing two ups. So they'll always be able to say like, we're focused entirely on these two games. Yes. Um, that should help. But by the way, one quick note is that yesterday I heard Chris Tang say something like, you know, we were seeing these, these very high score, these, like these players pushing each other. He said, you know, what we're seeing today is that players are pushing each other and that's what's causing the, the level of play to elevate so high. So we're getting, you know, these, these dueling 1.1s and stuff. Yeah. Um, Nuts. and I said, well, and then, and he also said, and that's, that's what's different today. And I agree with him, but I also disagree because what you'll see in 2014, what you'll see in this movie is the exact same thing was happening. People were pushing each other. People were actively pushing each other. The difference was scale the number of people who were who were there to be pushed yeah there were only like 40 50 people in the universe of tetris there were only a few dozen max out players you yeah. know so what you were seeing was this this thing of jonas and harry um were essentially providing examples and thor you know like these these players who were providing examples and who were pushing the rest of the field um you saw that exact same kind of behavior happening. The difference is now the universe of Tetris is like thousands of people. I would, you know, I don't know how many max outs we have now, but it's, it's definitely more than a hundred. And so to, to 200 to 20, I think. Yeah. I don't know for sure. <laughs> and we, we, I mean, there was even a part in this movie and I'm not going to spoil it, but there's a, a big hilarious argument in my kitchen uh, after the <laughs> Sunday night where some players are arguing about, whether it's possible for a random new player, a new like let's say the the, the here's the gambit. Let's yeah. say you could get a million dollars, a random person off the street, if yeah. somebody was providing million dollar prizes, Bill Gates just giving out a million dollars to anybody who can pick up NES Tetris and max it out in one calendar year. How many people in the what the what is the percentage of the population who would attempt that would actually get the million dollars? That was the question in 2014. Yeah. And what's fascinating is the people who had already maxed out said, you know, most of them. It's like people, and I think Ben Mullen said something like, "If they have two thumbs, they're gonna they're gonna get it, right? Because a million dollars <laughs> is a million dollars. It's like it's not. There's nothing special there. The people in that room who had not maxed out, yeah, had a very different opinion. They were like, "We think there is something intrinsically difficult, and you know." Like the, the, the ability to max out is so difficult that it just cannot be done except by these extremely specialized people. And what's yeah. been proved lately is, oh, you can max out. If you want to max out, you can max out. It's going to happen. Um, but we didn't know that was possible because we didn't have streaming and we didn't have game footage. People were recording these games on their VCRs if they were lucky, you know, like it was a different era. So. I am so pleased to see that the pushing now is we're pushing past boundaries that were impossible. 29 play was, you know, we didn't, we had hyper tapping a little, um, but like this is even pre-Corion. This is right before yeah. Corion enters the scene and 
it's it's a beautiful thing. What uh, do you want us to see what what the scene was back in 2014? Or do you want to implement the knowledge that we have today? Uh, do you want to add that to the to the film? That's a really good question that I haven't fully resolved. So this <laughs> is a writing problem that I have with Gilbert, where it's like, how do we deal with the present versus the past? I think that the probably the best way to present the film is from the perspective of you know 2014 and leading up to it. Um, however, there will be voices like the commentary, you know, that are happening in 2021 or whatever, like whenever we record that, which is soon. Yeah. Um, there's no way to pretend that the future never happened, right? Uh, but I think that for it to be a, an exciting film to watch, you probably need to take it from where it is. So it's like if let's say you made a movie about, um, you know, football clubs playing in 1965, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to be like saying, you know, to, to start in 2010 and say, okay, well, this is where this club ended up. It would make more sense to say, okay, well, in 1960, here's where they were. And then five years later, we're going to see how they're doing. It's, it's, we have to situate them in time, I think. Yeah. We also can't ignore that things later happened. But I think the way I'm going to do it is if you didn't know, like if you're not a Tetris, you know, if you're not already deep in the Tetris world, it should make sense to you. There should be nothing in this movie that's like not, you know, understandable. So a, a normal average person can watch this movie and like learn about the Tetris and figure it out. And that's fine. Um, if you are somebody who has seen what happened later, you're going to see a lot of echoes. You're going to be like, oh, I see. And then this leads to this, which leads to this, which, hmm, right? Yeah. Kind of like when you watch Ecstasy of Order and you see Thor and you're like, boy, this hyper tapping thing seems like a thing, right? <laughs> you know, like how come more <laughs> people aren't trying this? Um, there's a little bit of that, that echoing. And I'm, but that's, a, that's one of the biggest challenges, honestly, in, in the edit, in the, like, you know, the next stage of this, which is how much do we, how much do we try to, you know, like I don't, I don't want to shoot new material because I don't think we have to, but I yeah. am writing new narration. Right. So, and part of it is a lot of the players, uh, I think maybe all of the players that I've, I'm featuring are still playing, you know, they're not in that top eight bracket in 2020, but like they go on to do things like, by the way, Jeff Moore is also in this movie. And so like, you know, like a lot of the, a lot of the players that you see today have been there. It's not, it's not so long ago <laughs> that they're not. They're not the same folks, but the people who are winning, like especially this year, yeah, uh, it's a different group, you know. And so, and I want to celebrate that, but that's a different movie to celebrate in, right? Like this movie is about the you know people that we actually have on camera from back then, yeah. Uh, but there's a lot that they say that points toward the future. And one of the like, there's a point where Terry says, "Look, Jonas, there's like no gameplay footage of Jonas on the internet. Like I I have found and downloaded every game, and there's only six of them." Yeah. And you're like, Jonas, there's not enough gameplay of Jonas on the internet. Like in 2020, Jonas plays every day on the internet. You know, that's his job. So like, it's a, it's a fascinating difference just in how like Twitch and all those things changed the scene and changed the game and made yeah. it possible for people to understand how to do it. Who's currently working on, on the movie? Currently it is me, uh, Gilbert Tang. Um, and we have an editor, uh, named Ryan Douglas. Um, he is doing the kind of mechanical parts of, you know, going through and putting sequences together. He actually edited that two minute, like, um, you know, fast cuttings, the thing we keep playing at the, at the tournament. Yeah. Um, also, but mostly right now, like, because the money didn't come in yet, it's mostly me. So, uh, we do have some early scoring work going on. Carl King wrote all the music that's, that you've heard so far in these videos. Um, and he's been doing some score work to get ahead of it um being i've just paid him early for the you know things i can but at this point like part of it is like we go through and gilbert and i figured out um how do we want to tell how do we want to break out the episodes like what happens in episode one what happens in the, at the end of the episode five or whatever yeah. if we make more money do we do we push it to six episodes and if so what is the extra episode is it just like is it some fun side thing or is it just more you know or or how the scene is right now yeah, exactly. Is is there a way to say, well, look, because that won't come out until last, do we, you know, like it, there's there's a lot of a dance here about, um, like I we we're, we're promising the first episode for April of 2021. Yeah, and I 
we're promising my, my thing is I want to promise something and then I want to beat the promise. So like April, like you, you're going to get an episode in April. You're probably going to get an episode sooner than April. But then like, if we have five episodes, I, I have made no statement about whether you get them in May, June, July, like how long does it take for each other episode? Right. Yeah. So that's, that is a question. Like we don't know what the world will look like by April. And I don't know whether it will be meaningful for me to be able to shoot more material. Right. Like, so if, if I have extra budget, and I have a story to tell, then maybe there is a, a reason to go ahead and do a sixth episode that focuses on something that's newer or more interesting, yeah. you know, and if it's safe, right? And maybe it will be, like that will be at the time it comes up, right? So we're keeping those options open because, I mean, why not, right? Like, but at this point, that that's also part of why going past the initial budget actually is meaningful, right? Because if we if we end up at, you know, Ten thousand dollars. We will have a a good budget to do a really solid five episodes with like great original score and great design, and it'll be yeah. terrific, right? If we get fifty thousand dollars, which I don't think we will, but if we do, uh, we got to think about that. We got we got to stand back and be like, oh, okay, what do we do now? Like, what do we do with this extra stuff? Because we're not just gonna, I'm not just going to take that money and just you know take a vacation. I'm going to no. put that on screen, and so. Uh, I don't know. So given that we still have like a month essentially in, in funding left, like I am very curious and you may have noticed the Kickstarter actually ends after the finals, several days after the 2020 finals. Yeah. Cause if we get another champ and if they agree to do it, I would love to offer a lesson with that champ too. Oh, now, be amazing. who knows? Like there's a lot of folks in that, uh, there's seven folks in that bracket who are not Joseph, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you never know. And um, you want to be ready for stuff for stuff like that. I, I am I am grateful to be doing this and I'm grateful that there are so many options as well. Right. And yeah. so part of part of part of saying like, look, please back my Kickstarter is you're gonna get to see some of the hashing of like as we hash it out, as we figure out what is the strategy here. Like we have the broad strategy, but then there's a lot of specific like tactical decisions to be made yes and that's what you get uh, if you're a backer you get the like the behind the scenes especially if you get the director uh commentary streams where we're going to be just very honest like like look i'm going to open the project the premiere project on my computer and like we're just going to start clicking around like do you want to see some cool scenes check this out you know or whatever like i'm all about outtakes and bloopers and all that stuff so uh when i by the way when i say five episodes um there probably will be special features, which I don't yeah. include in that. And so I don't know how I'm going to do that, but they'll, they'll just, they, they will exist somehow and you'll get them. Um, but there's a lot of side stuff in here. Like, for example, we have like, I think it's 90 minutes of, of talking with John Tran about guideline Tetris, which yeah. has nothing to do with CDWC, but it's a nice interview. It's a great interview. And like, um, we could, we could probably get to John and talk to him more today, six years later, if we wanted to, if we wanted to make a whole like sort of sub side feature about how has guideline Tetris, you know, how has that scene worked lately? Um, yeah. That's something we're thinking about. What are the distribution plans for the movie? Is it going to do straight to DVD or are we going to see it on a streaming site or do you want it to, do you want it to be on TV some, someday? So I, I come from a background where uh, it's important to own the creative work that you make, right? Like yeah. um, when I was in bands, we were never signed on labels. We made records at our house and sold them, right? Yeah. Um, and in movies, sometimes you have to make big compromises. Like in movies, uh, if you have a, a movie with a budget of like, you know, $500,000 and you don't have $500,000, you make a compromise. Somebody gives you the money, you make the movie, but now you have to do what they say, right? Yes. This is not that. I have spent at least $20,000 of my own money making this movie so far, and I will spend more. Um, but you know, the Kickstarter will help with that. Now over the years, I, you know, what I mean is, uh, I've never borrowed money or taken investors. So I have every option in how I want to distribute the movie. Yes. My bias as a punk rock teen or whatever is <laughs> to distribute it uh in the punk rock style to say okay it's going to be on the internet in a like you'll have to have a password or whatever it'll make it easy you know and you're going to go to a place and you can stream it there and you can probably download an mp4 and if you you know like even if technically you're not supposed to like i'm pretty sure you'll figure out a way and i i don't care like yeah. that's the intent 
the intent right now is to provide a user streaming service called Vimeo on demand, which enables, you know, you go there, you get a code. I, I will email everybody a code and then they'll special to each person and they'll go in and make an account and then they yeah. download and stream and whatever, have fun. Now that doesn't close down the op- the options of other things, right? So although no one has contacted me and said, Hey, I'm from, you know, Netflix or Amazon or whatever, and I would like to carry this. It's possible. Uh, the, one of the things that's also a challenge is that a lot of the footage for this thing was shot when 1080p was the standard. So yeah. it's about it's about like three quarters 1080p and a little bit of 4K. And right now, um, the only content that you ever see coming that's like new content that has 1080 stuff in it is documentary uh, on yes. streaming services. But they have standards that are like if you're shooting a new movie today, you are like don't like you, you have to give us like the maximum resolution. So that's a challenge and that's a a technical thing where some streaming services will look at this and say, well, if it's not in 4K HDR, I don't want it because it's not technically interesting to me. Mm -hmm. But if we have a lot of people who are interested in this movie and think it's cool, um, I think that it could be distributed by somebody bigger. Um, My, to answer your actual question, I would, what I want is for a lot of people to see this movie. Yeah. Right. And I will do what it takes for that to happen. But my responsibility is to my backers, the people who put down the money and said, I want the movie to get made. You're going to get the movie, right? Now, if somebody comes along and says like, hi, I'm from, you know, some giant corporation and I want to take the movie and like, you know, shut this down or whatever. No, like, thank you. But no, if it's an add on, if they're like, look, we'll let you distribute this to all your people and then we'll go ahead and show it on our service later. Yeah. Uh, That'd be great. And if you're listening to the right that, if you, if you happen to work at a large streaming service and you'd like to contact me, uh, go to chrisiggins.com and go to the contact form. Yeah. But you know, like I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. I think that this is a, a fairly special purpose thing, right? Yeah. So I think, I think what'll happen is I'll sell it on Kickstarter. People will buy it. After Kickstarter, I'll when we have episodes up, I'll have a little way where you can go and buy it. Then you know, you can go and go with basically, you know purchase the series after it actually exists or maybe during it being released. Um, yes. But, and, and, you know, I would love it, uh, both financially and for the audience, um, if there were some way to get a much bigger audience. Right. Um, and I have constructed the project explicitly so that I, that is possible. I have nobody who owns anything and every contract is written so that I can distribute it because I thought I was, I thought I was going to make a 90 minute movie. That's going to be in theaters. Like, and I'd have to go through a distribution company. Um, yeah. so it's possible. I don't think it's likely, but it's possible, I guess. Uh, yeah. My final question is why do we need to back the Kickstarter? And if we don't have the money right now, why should we buy the movie next year? If you are in a position, and it's so, someone listening to this, you know, if you're in a position where spending 15 or $20 us is difficult for you, um, but you might be able to come up with it later, like next year. Um, you should wait, you know, if it's going to be a, if it's a problem for you financially, you should wait because the movie will still be here. The movie will happen like that yeah. has now been demonstrated by everybody else. Um, the thing that you will miss out on, and I'm sorry, you'll miss out on it, but you will, um, is the updates along the way. You'll miss out on the director's commentary streams. Um, and those are going to be. I don't know if you've, if you've seen these, but CGP Grey uh, does these things where when he makes a video on YouTube, he does another stream uh, where he basically like just opens like his editing app and shows you, you know, plays 30 seconds of it and then stops it and says, OK, OK, this shot right here. Check out. Here's the, like, let me tell you the backstory. And then goes this whole tangent, you know, and, and shows you shots that he didn't use and all this other stuff. Um, yeah. Those are going to be a lot of fun because we're going to have a big... Uh, we, we're going to be able to bring in guests, you know, like we, I have this whole zoom thing set up. And, uh, I think that's, that thing is a $5 add on. Um, I think it's extremely worth it if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and I don't know how to sell it later. It's the other thing. Like, I don't yeah. know how to sell that thing. Like the, how, you know, how do you buy a ticket to a stream? Like maybe I can do it, but that the reason to do it now would be to be able to follow along and to, f- to hear us and and we're not going to like bug you every, we're not going to say every week, like, here's a bunch of stuff we're struggling with. Like, we're going to say, this is, this is what's happening. And, you know, um, or for example, like, do you want to see behind the scenes pictures of, you know, what is the setup for when we were do the re the, the recording of the new commentary? Like, what does it look like? Yeah. And how did, like, what is the video that those commentators are looking at so we can give them the best possible 
view to simulate being in the tournament hall, right? Yes. Um, you're not going to be able to get this. It's just not going to be possible if you're not, you know, getting those Kickstarter uh, updates. So that's the thing to get. At the same time, I want to be very clear. Like, I don't want to pressure anybody into doing something that is financially uh, difficult for them uh, because that's not. It's not right. <laughs> so True. I understand we're living in an unusual time and I don't, I don't think anyone should feel, you know, bad that if it's a problem for them and I, and I will be here to, you know, give you a great movie, um, when you can, right? Like, so, you know, I, 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 I want, I would love to have the money now and I think it would be more fun for you now. Um, yeah. and over the coming year, but also, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to be okay. There's going to be Tetris regardless of uh, whether you can chip in the money today or not. Where do we need to go to back to Kickstarter? Uh, we have a special uh, URL set up. If you go to tetrischampion.com, that will redirect you to Kickstarter slash blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm pretty sure if you go to, te- to kickstarter.com and just search for like Tetris, right? Or best of five, which is the name. It's called best of five, the Tetris champions, Tetris. Yes. Tetris champions. Yeah. We, <laughs> we had a whole discussion about the titling like very recently. Um, you'll, you'll be able to find it pretty easily, but just hitting Tetris champion.com is the easiest way to get to there. And when you get there, there's a big video. There's a whole bunch of writing there about like, you know, what is this? Who is the team? Um, photos of people who are working on it and stuff like that. And a bunch of rewards. Like there's other stuff we haven't talked about and go read about those. Um, one thing I do want to briefly mention, Kickstarter has a beta feature called add-ons. And this dislike is very new. Like this came out, I think in the past month or two. And so we had to apply for a special beta program to get it. And what it is, is like in, in the old days, when you back to Kickstarter, you had to be like, I want, you had to construct the tier. So it was like, poster blu-ray blu-ray yeah. plus poster you know book book plus blu-ray plus poster plus you know like you had to make these terribly confusing things yes um with add-ons you pick the thing you want even if it's like the cheap thing and then in the checkout process they're like would you also like a poster or a blu-ray or two or you know whatever and we discount those things like buy 25 bucks when you get to that point because you've already bought the movie. So yeah, uh, just a, one thing to note because it's just new. So if you've backed Kickstarters before, you you know you might not know that that's going to happen. And I was, it's also confusing because when we when we add new rewards, they go to the bottom of the add-ons. So if you go and edit your pledge, you're like, I'm not sure I'm seeing the thing I want. Well, like hit hit next and then <laughs> and then scroll down and they'll get there. So it's a new thing. It's a little bit not buggy, but it's just like not fully like baked, but it will work. And, uh, it's another way to, to say if you're somebody who like really just wants the Blu-ray or whatever, like you, you can do that. Um, yeah. or if you want an unusual combination, you know, like, uh, you can really build your own and that used to have to go to a third party company. Uh, so I'm <laughs> glad we don't have to do that because again, we're running this pretty cheap. It's, <laughs> you know, it's me. Chris, I thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure to talk about anything about the documentary and about CTWC. Well, thank you, Frank. I, I really appreciate, you know, or should I call you Sir Mazer? Uh, it, it's, <laughs> I, I think what you're doing here is important. Um, I'm surprised it's taken this long for a, a you know, a classic Tetris podcast to, to pop up, but this is, uh, this is a great place to be. And it's, it's my privilege to join you and, and to speak to your listeners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. And with that all being said, This will be the end of the Peace Dependency Podcast. Thank you all for listening and make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Don't forget to join the Kingsman Tetris Friendly Discord server and follow me on the socials at SirMazer. Don't forget to help Chris Higgins with his Kickstarter. Go to TetrisChampion.com and join the fun. For now, have a great Tetris time and I will see you all in December. Bye!